All right, everybody. How are you doing? Everybody enjoying our fall seasons as they start to kick off here in the north? I suppose it'll slowly work down the south. Oh, some teal seasons opened, probably closed already. Our early goose, early goose season here in Minnesota uh, just wrapped up this past weekend. So nothing going on. But then the duck opener this weekend, which I will miss because I will be in uh, South Carolina. I'm uh, going to fish for redfish and sharks for one day and then road tripping back to Minnesota. But uh, that little trip there is going to impede my duck opener, which will be the first duck opener I miss in a long-ass time. But you do what you got to do, right? Well, also this past weekend, I had my last two events of my bass fishing club, Loon State Bassmasters. Um, day one uh, on Sturgeon Lake, I did all right. I came in second, uh, but first place, congratulations, Nick. Uh, he blew me out of the water. He had like 17, over 17 pounds. I had 13 and change, and then uh, the next nearest was 10, and then everybody... I think there's only one person else that got over 10 and so it's kind of a kind of a tough day out there lots of cookie cutter like two pounders in that lake it's just like everybody kind of stalled out around that 10 pound range i was doing the right things uh well maybe not the right things but fishing the right water i mean i was deep jigging um weed lines and uh, i was getting my bites there Nick was kind of fishing the same waters. We weren't in the same spot in the lake, but kind of the same waters, as far as I understand it. You know, I'm sure he's not giving me all the secrets. Uh, but he was deep cranking. I did throw a crank a little bit, but um, just not deep enough. I wasn't dredging the bottom. I was kind of clipping the tops, thinking maybe they would come out. Uh, in hindsight, I guess I should have thought, I mean, if I'm catching my jigs, meaning they're down at the bottom, and they were kind of, some of my, st I stuck with the jig mostly because I had confidence in it. And two, a couple of the bass that I pulled up, they were already starting to shed out some crayfish claws. So I'm like, well, they're eating crayfish, so this jig should work. And it did. I mean, I got a, a respectable bag and took second place, but it wasn't enough for first. And I really wanted to get uh, first place this season, which I had not done yet. So here comes Sunday. Get out there. Di totally different lake. And uh, this lake sets up kind of it's upper and lower lakes. And they set up kind of like a ditch. I mean, it's... I knew it was kind of be a crapshoot because everybody's going to kind of be forced to fish shoreline pretty much. You know, pitching docks, there's lily pads, really sharp weed line there, stained water, just kind of a different fishery. Uh, I kind of stuck with the frog, and I, I got some good, decent fish on a frog. A um, couple jig bites off docks, uh, but just couldn't really get quality, quality fish. I mean, the fish were okay, but they, they weren't as good as I knew they were going to have to be to uh, take first in this lake. Uh, I got fourth. <laughs> well, fourth and third are pretty close, and then it was just like Sturgeon. Um, first and second blew everybody out of the water. Uh, first place was over 18 pounds, so congratulations, Cody, on that one. That was a hell of a bag, and he was frogging. That's what I was doing. So, like I said, it was kind of a crapshoot. Maybe he's using a different style of frog or moving it slower or faster. Uh, that got them those better bites, but so that's it. 2019 Loon State Bassmaster season in the books, and uh, I didn't win one, so that sucks. <laughs> Second's good, I mean, but and then I fell way down in like league rankings because I was listening to the damn Packers and Vikings game on my phone. Didn't realize it was going late, so yeah, when it was over, I looked at my phone and it was like 3:15. Uh, way in was three o'clock. So yeah, after 15 minutes, you're pretty much disqualified, which I would have disqualified myself. Would have been mad if I knew I had a big bag. Of course, if I had a big bag, I probably would have been watching the clock a little closer, but yeah, that's how it goes. So there's that. So now it's time. Now it's fun fishing for the rest of the fall and uh, starting to look forward to duck season once I can partake in that. But my mind keeps wandering to ice fishing, which... I'm sad for some people, but I'm looking forward to it. it. Is right around the corner, so you know, yeah, we got to get through Halloween, blah 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 blah. But once Thanksgiving rolls around in Minnesota here, that weekend, you can usually find fishable ice somewhere. Sometimes you got to go way the hell up north, and sometimes not so much. And seeing as how it seems, to, I mean, we're in a heat wave right now, but it seems like we're having an early fall. So maybe we'll have an early winter too, and get on that ice sooner than later. 
If that's something that you've never done, you want to do, or you know somebody that's interested in it, give me a call. Log on to the website, FullScaleOutdoors.com, and uh, it's time to start booking those ice fishing trips. I'll get you out in portables. You'll be heated. I'm going to draw the holes for you. I got all the equipment. I got the flashers. I got everything you need. And we're going to go out there and uh, get those early, early ice fish. So give me a call. Let's book some trips. Let's catch some fish. Uh, Malax was treating me good last year. If you really want a chance at a trophy walleye, that's your spot. If you want something to eat, we can go somewhere else. Um, but also trophy Northerns as I got a 43 incher replica on the wall that I caught out in this spot last year. So got a great early season spot. Hit me up. Let's book a trip. Let's do this. Before we dive into this episode, I want to quick, I got to bug everybody. Got to do all the things, all the Facebooky things, you know, if you haven't already, like Full Scale Outdoors on Facebook, Full Scale underscore Outdoors on Instagram, Dale Luganville on Snapchat. Um, just make sure you're subscribing to this podcast. You can also find us on the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. Subscribe to that. That's going to give you a shit ton of outdoor themed podcasts to listen to. You will not going to run out. And um, rate where you can. And review where you can. That really helps. And uh, if you know someone that, you know, share it with somebody. Send them, a, send them a link. Text them. Send them a message in Facebook. Whatever it is. Somebody you think might be keen on it. Hit them up. Let's do it. If uh, if you're new, welcome. Thanks for listening. Uh, you're going to find a lot of craziness in my show. <laughs> Rambles from time to time. As I'm pretty much doing now. Um, but... We hit all the aspects of the outdoors. It's not just a hunting and or fishing, you know, it's uh, foraging. And in this one, it's all about cooking. I ran to this guy at the game fair, and we got to talking. And it's very likely that I used one of his recipes the first time I went to cook a beaver. And it was for a beaver stroganoff recipe, and it was fantastic. So good. But I thought I got pretty good at cooking wild game. And then until I met this guy, and I started looking at his his uh, Instagram site, and I'm like, huh, huh, I, am, I am so far out of his league when it comes to the culinary arts. I, I got some learning to do. So I was super pumped to do this one. And to be honest with you, I think this is my favorite episode that I've done so far. It's kind of saying a lot because I pretty much like them all. But this one is really good. Uh, his name is Jamie Carlson. You can find him at You Cook It Right, all one word, on Instagram. And I think it's like you you have to cook it right on Facebook. And then there's a website there too. Uh, but I think he's moving everything over. I'm sure we get into this to um, www.modern or modcarn.com. Sorry, modcarn, M O D C A R N.com. And uh, it's basically a blog, is a shit ton of really good recipes. But. Um, super cool dude to talk to, uh, knows a lot about how to cook this stuff. And we get into that. It's waterfall season right now. And that's a large part of what we talked about is how there's so many people still today. I saw on Facebook today, a debate, how do you cook geese? And of course you got the old guy, oh, throw this out in the pot, eat the wood or, you know, whatever you, you got to learn how to cook it. And honestly, less is more. You don't have to get fancy with it. It's, it's great meat, but if you're interested in learning how to get the best from your wild foods, whether it be wild game, fish, forage stuff, this is the episode for you. Can't wait to get into it. You're really going to like it. So here we go. This is the Full Scale Outdoors podcast with Jamie Carlson. <laughs> oh, here we go, boys. Go. Love that sound. This is a good one. It's easy. <laughs> like, ah, oh, after reading this book, you'll have it down. No, no, no. Yeah, because what was like I? A uh, language you have to learn. I don't even know that that's a good explanation. Because what? There's three and a half million different types of mushrooms out oh, there. Yeah. It's and like 0.2% of them are edible. <laughs> right. And it, well, 
I do recommend the book, Mushroom <coughs> Demystified, because it it takes a while because it's not a book you read from no. front to back. It's uh, and it's more than a field guide. It's like a road map, if you will, the way it's laid out. And it's really, once you kind of get the feel of how it works, it's almost like learning a language. You struggle with it, you struggle with it, and all of a sudden it clicks. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, I get it now. And so you, you take your mushroom, you find. It can be any mushroom. And you start in the very beginning of the book, and it just will say, you know, what's the shape? Is it concave? Is it convex? Is it is the stem this is this and you just start checking off things it's go, all right go see this page and you're in there and it's like is it this is this this if so go to here if not keep going down the list mm-hmm. and it's just to check off all the things then you get down to it and sometimes you deviate to the wrong path with it and you kind of got to go back it's kind of like losing a blood trail on a deer you know you go back to that last blood drop start spiraling out again <laughs> you know until you find the next one you're like okay i think i'm narrowing down i'm getting it closer and closer and closer then what i'll do is if i have it narrowed down to like three or four the scientific name to the mushrooms then i start cross-referencing it with like google because the mm-hmm. book does have a ton of pictures but it doesn't have pictures of everything but thankfully we have google yeah so i just start cross-referencing and i have the actual mushroom in my hand or i took really good pictures of it of the top of the side of the cap where it came from was it growing out of the dirt was it growing out of wood all these things matter yeah like where in, where in the continent you found it what time of year like all the details matter when it comes yeah. to mushrooms and uh generally i can whittle it down and it's like all right this one's good or this one's bad and you just toss it out you just if you're not sure just don't eat it. Yeah, I love mushrooms. But I don't love them that much. No, <laughs> and no. so far, knock on wood, I haven't. I haven't had any uh, gastro issues yet. Yeah. So Are you familiar with Hank Shaw? It sounds very familiar. Uh, cookbook writer uh, does the hunt, gather, cook uh, oh, website and everything. Okay. Uh, Every time somebody sends him a picture uh, of a mushroom, says, "Is this edible?" It says, "Yes." Everything's edible, but once. maybe only the one time. <laughs> yep, I should have cut you off, but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> everything's edible once. Yep. Can you swallow it? It's edible. Yeah, it's edible. That plastic fork over there—you break you it off to bite might size. Not it's make edible. it after that. <laughs> but <laughs> yep, I get it all the time too. Not that I'm like the super extra expert when it comes to mushrooms, but I've. I'm constantly learning, and I know a few things. But mm-hmm. all my family and you know friends, they'll send they'll send me a picture. Hey, it's in their yard. Hey, what, is this edible? That's all. That's always is this yeah. edible? Not what is it? Can I eat it? It's like, well, I don't know. You showed me the top of it. What I need yeah. to know: Does it have fins? Does it have gills, pores? What's the stock like? Where is it growing? Like, I need all these information. And then sometimes they'll go back and they'll take pictures, yeah. and then I'll uh, try to take those and go through that book if I don't just know it, and then give them an answer but even then even if i'm like 99 percent sure i'm like i'm only 99 percent sure yeah so i'm not going to tell you to eat it or not eat it that's on you yeah but you can do some research it might be this you google yourself and and you're on your own yeah i've <laughs> only see i started with just like two you know chicken in the woods and morels easy you know yeah very and then, easy. you know after that it threw in, you know, a puffball. That was pretty easy, uh, you know. And then yeah, I just there. I kept working my way up and up and up. And now there's probably ten or eleven that I'm really comfortable with. And you know, outside of that, I don't really care. Yeah, once you <laughs> once you kind of get into it, it's like the lookalikes, the you know, the toxic or lookalikes. They're not. Mm-hmm. They're not really. Once you, I've never understood the whole false morel thing. It doesn't I mean, look like yeah, a morel. Gallerina doesn't look good. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Doesn't look yeah, like a I morel. don't think so at all. I mean, the not even a little wrong. bit. Uh, yeah, uh, and that's kind of what I'm getting at with a lot of the. So it's like chanterelles are a really good, safe one too. Yeah. Because the only one that even remotely looks like it is the jack o' lantern, and the color is really not the same. If you compare them side by mm-hmm. side, you're like, oh, well, these aren't. But jacks so have gills. The book I got, uh, Mushrooms of the Midwest, uh, mm-hmm. by Teresa Maroney and Kathy Eric. Um, I can tell you're an author because you know all the other authors. <laughs> I'd be like, there's this book by this guy. <laughs> I was John something or other. I don't know. He talked I, about food. I'm a name guy. <laughs> uh, I'm a name guy, and I remember names, and I try to remember the names, oh. and it, it really annoys some of my friends. I'm glad you <laughs> have it listed on your your uh, Instagram because I was like, crap, what was his name? Yeah. I'm the worst with names. It's Jamie, though. Yep. Right? Yes. Yep. Winning. Uh, in there, <clears throat> she talks about the false chanterelle. And okay. Like, apparently... 
it can cause problems, but hmm. maybe it doesn't, uh, and they're usually okay. But I'm like, I don't know the difference. Yeah, and I do. I know what you're talking <clears throat> about, and I think with that one, it's it really comes down to the individual because mm-hmm. some people in general are just sensitive to mushrooms right. of any kind, and even if you can just if you can generally eat mushrooms without any problems, but you eat mushrooms and you drink a beer and you drink a glass of wine, yeah, alcohol can mix with a lot of different mushrooms yep. and create some gastronomical stress within certain individuals. Yep. Thankfully, I'm not one of them. Neither I can am I. eat mushrooms and drink yeah. beer, and I'm good to go. I can do anything and drink beer. <laughs> 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 Except for drive. <laughs> it's not, not at the same time. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> Right. Well, introduce yourself, Jamie. My name is Jamie Carlson. Uh, I'm a nurse by trade, work at the Minneapolis VA, and uh, in my free time, I cook and eat wild foods. I love it, man. After my own heart, met you at the game fair, <coughs> stopped out, and I may or may not have already used some of your work. Well, we got to talking <laughs> it when I introduced Beaver, and I, I love talking about this because people get the, the freshman giggles. But Oh, yes. My wife loves to eat beaver. You just, you just got to let the jokes happen. They're going to yeah. happen. You just got to go with it. But um, she was apprehensive, obviously, because it's not something you'd think would be very delicious. They live in swamps. And they, but, but it, in my opinion, might be the best wild meat out there. I it absolutely ranks up there. love it. And, I mean, it's an herbivore. So yeah. you got that going for right. you. Yeah, they're just eating. And, you know, wood. everybody raves uh, about moose being so delicious and tender and wonderful. And there it is. But moose eat willow, and so do beavers. Right, yeah. Uh, and what goes in? Know, yeah. I, I, I hate to make a moose and a beaver the same thing, <laughs> but why not? Uh, but, yeah, beaver is delicious. And, yeah, I wrote an article a long time ago when I first started writing uh, about eating beaver. And, of course, you know, there was yeah, some yeah, comical just, things to it. Uh, let it happen. <laughs> but I was writing for a, a blog called Simple, Good, and Tasty. And they were kind of really pushing the ethical, uh, humane, sustainable, all the trend words for food. Oh, yeah. (coughs) So when I write this article about beaver, I tried to keep it, you know, I didn't go into the jokes. As PC as possible. I I figured they would come, and I had no problem. I tried to keep it. There's even a joke right there, but I'm going to go. I'm going to blast right past Uh, it. But then uh, what I did not expect was to get hammered on the trapping angle. Uh, oh. And how you know inhumane trapping is, and how uh, it's disgusting. Uh, and this lady just went off about how she's followed Simple Good and Tasty and thought it was a respectable site, but the fact that they'd allow something uh, as indecent as this, and, and I, I, I got angry. Well, I would, uh, I would have, and I, would have I, I was like, angry. I, I don't fully understand this because it, it's, it's pure ignorance. Absolutely, uh, you it know, is trapping. You know, people do have this image that there's a snare wrapped around a wolf's leg and it's, you know, gnawing its leg off, uh, all these different things. I even at one point thought that happened regularly. I thought, well, they step in a trap and they eat their own leg. Right. That never happens. Never happens. You know, uh, I I just met a guy. Uh, there was a thing online, free trapping class at the Forest Lake Gun Club or something like that. So I drove up there and this guy did a whole class on the whole thing uh, and god i learned so much about trapping <laughs> i've always wanted to do it my dad told me you can't do it it's it's inhumane it's bad oh really yeah. oh wow uh, yeah, that that's kind of a different angle coming from yeah i was kind of the same as i always wanted to trap like it was just kind of and i don't even know where it came from like nobody even hunting i'm i'm like you know what like renell always calls mm-hmm. adult onset yeah. hunting like i had i had that i mean i hunted a little bit in high school with a buddy of mine uh, but then we kind of got out of it and i got back into it as an adult mm-hmm. Self-taught but, pretty much all the I mean, way. We nobody watched, in my family hunted. We like watched nobody. Grizzly Adams when we were kids. Yeah, I loved Grizzly Adams. Yeah, yeah Grizzly everybody Adams did. And, you know, we saw Jeremiah Johnson. And, I mean, trapping was just, it was part of the cinematography and everything. And I, that we, I just always wanted to do it. That movie holds uh, up, Jeremiah Johnson. Oh, yeah. It's still a great movie. Yeah, best movie ever. <laughs> it's so good. But, yeah, my dad just, he... I think he was just lazy and didn't want to take me, or <laughs> he didn't want to learn something well, new. I know my dad wasn't going to take me, but he, he at one point in time, he was going to have me go out with the trapper. He's like, hey, I met this guy, he traps, and I mentioned that you're in, you're interested, and he said he would take you, and it just never worked out. He's like, you're going to have to get up early. I'm like, 
I don't care. Yeah. Like I, <clears throat> that doesn't bother me at all. Like Not I mean, at it all. never it never ended up happening, but and again, like I got I definitely had adult onset trapping. I mean, mm -hmm. I that was like after I got into hunting, then I dipped my toes into trapping. I and still haven't done it. Bring uh. it back to beaver is like I didn't trap beaver for the longest time because it takes more to put the pelts up. You know, they're really fatty and to flesh them, and there's yep. a lot of work. And it's not even – even the skinning them is different than a lot of the other animals. you got to make that nice round. You know, you just do it different. It's not just right straight down the belly. It's, it's, it's a different process, and there's a lot to it. So I kind of avoided it. And then I started picking up on this conversation that was being had about the meat. And what I picked up on was that there are two camps, people that rave about it, and the people who haven't tried it. I never once have read or heard from anybody that tried beaver and was like, eh, yeah. it's all right. No. No. If you eat it, you're like, this is awesome. Yeah. So I'm like, hmm. So as I was <coughs> just out um, scouting around the woods by my house, this wildlife management area, I found a spot that had the beavers have been using it so much, they literally have, like, little ditches carved up into, like, these islands within the swamp that they were going up and cutting the trees down. I mean, it's these trails are like two inches wider than the actual beaver on either side like this is a guaranteed catch yeah. like i don't have to do anything <laughs> i was like and it's close to my house heck yeah i'm gonna try this put a trap in there and two days later i had one the rest is history i brought yeah. it home skinned it ate it and i was like oh yeah yeah i didn't i didn't trap beaver last year and my wife saw me about it so this year I got to go out of my way. I want to get, and usually I just do spring beaver mm -hmm. just because it's, again, it's just easier. Yeah. You know, that, they, that ice, they really start to move, and they start using those trails like crazy. And uh, I'm not doing caster mount sets or anything. I'm just blind sets in those trails pretty much. And yeah. it's, they're, Works they're, pretty they, well. I get them. I get them every time. It's just a guaranteed thing. But I would like to do a fall beaver so I can get a nice fatty one and try the tail. Yeah. I've heard it's not good. You that know. I do get mixed <coughs> opinions on. Yeah. Like some people really like it, some people don't, and I, I probably won't like it, but I bet my wife will love it because she likes the the knuckles on a chicken, like yeah. a chicken leg. I'm not a big cartilage fan. I don't really care for the texture in mm -hmm. that. She's all about it, just like her dad, like chicken paws. Yeah. They like chicken feet. Uh, when I tried chicken feet, I was like, eh, it tastes all right. I mean, yeah. the, the the cartilage and the like gelatinous fat in it. I was like. Texture-wise, not a huge fan. Yeah. Flavor is fine, but I could live my whole life without eating another chicken foot and be just fine. I'd I heard mean, they were really good, so chickens I aren't, them. Chickens yeah. aren't, uh, you know, they're not a rarity. No. So I don't <laughs> feel the need to uh, eat the feet. I'll just go get another chicken. I mean, I raise chickens, so I mean, yeah. it's like I don't need to eat the feet. No. I mean, no, not <laughs> and You start getting little. down to that thing where, well, you got to use all of the animal. You know, there's a point to how much you have to, you know, like, do I have to start making my own pillows with the goose? <laughs> I mean, where do you draw the line of, you know, what's wanton waste and what's, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a line somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. I, uh, I'd i really like to try the beaver thing. Um, I, t I went to that class, took the day seminar, learned quite a bit about it. It seems like an interesting thing to do. Uh, we were in the Boundary Waters last year, went down Hog Creek on Parent Lake, and I mean, every hundred yards, there's a beaver dam. Yeah, and beavers everywhere. They were swimming next to the canoe. Oh, and that's cool. I had the idea, you know, <clears throat> set your traps going in, stay down for a night, right? Check, check them on the way out. out. Be a you know sort of an old fashioned romantic kind of yeah feeling. But yeah, beavers they the whole inhumane thing in trapping doesn't really hold up if you that's actually look no. into it. No, you know. Uh, if you want to talk inhumane, why do we bow hunt? You know, why do we rifle hunt? Right. Very rarely have I ever shot anything that was dead instantly. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, duck hunting. Most of them yeah. were wounded. A lot of uh, them. You know, goose yep. hunting, same thing. Yeah, you got to dispatch uh, them when you get them back. But, it but they get crazy about traps because, oh, it's just inhumane. Uh, from what I understand of these, uh, what are they, Dukes 555s? Uh, giant damn trap. The leg hold. Uh, no, the oh, the body. Bear? Yeah, the kind of bear. Okay. Uh, body traps. Body grip style. Yeah. You know that thing hits you. Uh, oh. Most of the time, it snaps the neck and kills them instantly. Uh, and, and if it, it doesn't do that, it drowns them in two minutes. Yeah. So I mean. <laughs> yep. And a lot of times it's less. I mean, a, a beaver can hold its breath for a really long time, but in almost like in a panicky situation, it's just like it would be for us. Yeah. They burn their reserves up a lot faster. Yep. 
the first time, um, and I had to put down uh, a beaver that I caught in a leg hold, and it didn't go down the slide like it was supposed to. It got caught up on some vegetation. So when yep. I got to it, it was still alive, you know, still swimming. Just the, just its foot, you know, was in there. So, you know, I had to, I didn't, I just drowned it. You know, I just got a fork stick, and I held it to the bottom. And, mm-hmm. and it. I thought, man, I'm going to have to hold this thing for, like, five minutes. This is a beaver. It's like, no, nah, it was, like, 30 seconds, and it yeah. was done. No. I mean, it was it was quick. Yeah. It was real quick. And like I said, it's based in ignorance. It's ignorance powered by emotion. It's right. It's a bad combination. Right. Yeah. But Same with bear hunting, lion hunting, all anything like else. It's, it's all. Even that, even as kind of, you know, definitely somebody who isn't a hunter trapper listening to that story I just told with me having to drown that beaver. And I didn't enjoy it by any stretch of the imagination. It was just something that had to be mm-hmm. done. And then I can see how that might bother them. But I promise you when an eagle gets a hold of one of those things or a coyote pulls it out of the den or off the dam or what, it's not that quick. No. Uh, When a bear or a wolf gets hold of a beaver, they just hold it down and eat it while it's alive. Yeah. It's it's not. Death in (coughs) nature is rarely quick. Yeah. Unless a mountain lion's doing it. That's pretty quick. Well, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They're pretty efficient. Yeah. I've heard about mountain lions that they've got sensors in their fangs that can sense the pulse so that they can bite right really? into sensitive areas. I guess I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I mean, evolution does a really, really good job. Yes, it does. <laughs> now, uh, you've said you're drowning this beaver. I'm just going to prepare you to have the police called on you at some point in time. Uh, oh. Because, God, what was it? Uh, Seven, eight years ago, uh, I had trapped some turtles uh, and was going to cook them. Mm-hmm. And read a book about it and in the book it had said that uh, you need to keep those turtles alive for a week and change the water out regularly to flush the system Mm -hmm. i've heard the same thing some of the things that came out of that turtle were i I didn't understand how it ate them (laughs) Uh, there were rocks and there were little big pieces of branch yeah yeah the turtle eats anything uh so i did that (coughs) butchered him cooked him up made a fantastic general so's turtle uh, and a few weeks later, knock on the door, and there's a cop at my house. Really? <laughs> yeah. And I'm just looking at this guy, and I'm confused. And he's like, I just want you to know everything's okay. And I'm like, no, you, there's a police officer at right my house. It's okay. What, what's, what's going on, <laughs> man? Uh, and he explained to me that uh, somebody from PETA uh, oh had uh, read through whatever rule book, uh, and in the rule book uh, came up with some law I had violated about keeping a wild animal and not feeding it so i had kept these turtles alive mm, for a week sure. and didn't feed them uh, well they don't need to eat every day you're within its feeding schedule yeah exactly you got a, you got a, you got a solid <laughs> argument there well there was there, there was no <laughs> argument there and and the officer didn't really have a problem either he, he was just, just had to buy yeah, yeah he had he, to do his he, due diligence he needed to come out and talk out, to yeah. me and he said really i'm mostly here because uh, they sent pictures of your house and you should know that somebody is watching. Right. Well, good on him. Yeah. yeah. So he, he just said, you know, I read the DNR website and they. Well, I will competed to come out to my place. <coughs> the exact nice process he went through is exactly what it says on yeah. the DNR website. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, well, I thought I was in bounds, but. Right, yeah. What is, with with turtles, I guess I haven't really read the rules. Yeah. You're supposed to dispatch them immediately? Is that no, kind of thing? No, or? it's it's a it's a harsh and brutal process. And it takes a while, but yeah, you're supposed to flush them out with water, and oh. it takes a while. Yeah, and yeah. just somebody was offended. Yeah, well, it's again, you know, turtles are. Then it just goes back to ignorance. I mean, yeah. turtles are a reptile. They they don't eat every day. No, they no, don't once need to a eat month, every maybe. day. Yeah. So to have one clean its system out, if it takes seven days, like it's not starving. No. They, no. they, they're they just fine. Well, and, I mean, I got all sorts of hatred because of that one, because turtles are endangered and all these other things. I'm like, <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're really, <laughs> they're really not. Yeah. There's a couple of varieties of turtle that are endangered. And yeah. You yeah. noticed I didn't eat a Blanding's turtle. Yeah. It was I didn't, a have, a so- I didn't have a spiny soft shell, which, yeah. boy, those, their numbers <coughs> have to be getting back to almost normal. I see them everywhere. We're catching them on the river. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't fishing for walleyes. See them, you know, growing up, I don't remember yeah. really seeing them. The first time I saw one, I was like, oh, wow, check it out, because I've been, you know, huge into animals like my, my whole life you know it's kind of a weird transition it's actually my friend's dad when i got into hunting he's like how did this happen he's, he used to be 
Mr. Greenpeace, and now you're the mighty hunter of the north. <laughs> I'm like, eh, I got wise. Yeah. <laughs> I fished with a guy down by Wabasha, uh, and he's sort of a freak. Uh, like, he'll hook, and he knows what he's got. Mm. You know, and I, I've caught a lot of dang fish in my life, but I just, I'm not talented enough to know, by the way, it's fighting and swimming. Uh, what kind of fish it is. And, you know, most of the time he's right. He's like, oh, it's a good walleye. Mm-hmm. You know, 22, 23 incher. He'll bring it up and, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> yeah, right there. You know, uh, or he'll get something else. He's like, ah, oh, damn it, I've got a sheep's head. Yep. You're like, oh, I'm sorry. He just does it a lot. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Uh, and he got one one day and he was like, God, I don't know what this is. And he said it was just gumming at it. And he thought it was a walleye the way it was just sensitive bite. But when he set the hook, he said it felt like he just set it into a rock. And then it didn't Basically swim. Did. Yeah. <laughs> and then it just didn't swim. And he tried and he tried and he tried. And at one point he was like, I think this is the biggest walleye I've ever caught. And if that's true, I'm just going to cut the line because if I, if I continue to fight this, I'm going to kill it. Right. Uh, but I was like, no, at this point. <laughs> no, I need you, to see it. Yeah, you got to you gotta bring it up. <laughs> and he brought it up, and it was a giant soft-shell t- turtle. Oh, wow. Uh, and I mean, he's like, well, that's why I didn't know. I've never I caught one of these. I didn't know they got that big. No. They get manhole yeah, size. Yeah, like, and, and this was a little bit smaller than that, but it was probably a good oh, 18 inches across, uh, and that's a giant that's a good, turtle. That's a yeah. good turtle. Oh uh, yeah, I've seen some absolute massive ones, but I'm seeing more and more of them. So no. hopefully they're, they're and we tried to get that hook back. out, and God dang, oh you got to just cut yeah. that line and be done with it. <laughs> if you like your fingers, yeah. I mean, no, I got hold of it with the pliers and was trying to like work it out because yeah. it was hooked perfectly yeah. right in the outer lip. It's yeah, your best bet is if you had some side cutters, you probably could have yeah. cut the barb and then maybe it would have pulled out. But yeah, yeah, I mean it's. A, that's a tough mouth to yeah. get a hook in. Probably even tougher to get it out. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Oh, I remember I rescued a – well, I attempted to rescue a snapping turtle when I was in, like, middle school. It had gotten wedged in, like, a storm drain. It's, like, just that slot along the curb. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, he was too – his shell was too tall for him to fit in there. He was trying to get in the water. So, my buddies were riding bikes. We saw his thing. So, we went and got some sticks. And we're, he was wedged in there. We were prying him out, and he's snapping at us the whole time. I finally pull him up, you know – throw him up on the lawn and then, there you go buddy he turns 180 shunk, just gets stuck I'm like oh, you're on your own now <laughs> <laughs> I tried <coughs> uh, yeah I always hate that time of the year too uh, you know late late April May June I, I just don't understand why people hit them it doesn't make any sense not, to me they're looking at the phone yeah well they're just not paying attention I mean I, they're not darting out in front of you no and I don't know about I mean you know a pain turtle is one thing but Hitting a, you yeah. know, twenty pound snapper, you're yeah. gonna know that. Like yeah. you're gonna feel that one exactly when you go over that thing. And it's I just not a small animal. It always upsets me. I I live down in Burnsville and I drive back and forth the the VA, and there's a big long bridge right there going over the Minnesota River in that whole valley down there. The turtles everywhere in there, and there's always turtles up on yep. cedar, and you're like, God, why? People just don't pay attention. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it too, I, and I agree. It's like I don't, I don't like it for a couple of reasons. One, because it's just a, a needless loss of life, and you're yeah. like, God, oh, that just sucks. And also, it's a waste of good meat. Yeah, it's the same thing when I see a smashed beaver. I'm like, oh man. Yeah. No, I'll tell you. After <laughs> I uh, after I caught those two turtles and cooked them and ate them, I I just said I'll never do it again. Really? Yeah. Oh, I <clears> loved it. Oh, well, it was delicious, but the process of going through work. it. Yeah. It, I, I didn't enjoy the process. Uh, I didn't enjoy uh, the fact that they don't die. They really don't. No. I mean, these things. Uh, I read everything, you know, cut the head off, uh, hang them for an hour, let the blood drain out. I did that. I tried to cut them into it. It was pushing back on me. What, what is their blood made out of, too? Because it's, like, yeah. <laughs> sticky. Like, you get it. it literally, it's like, it's like handling glue. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's the weirdest thing. Like, the first time I cleaned a, a turtle, I'm like, what? What what is going on? Yeah. Like the moment it touches your skin, it, it ceases to be a liquid. Yeah, it's the g- strangest damn thing. These things are aliens, and the same thing. So it's like the first one. I wanted to keep the shell intact. You know, mm-hmm. generally if you're gonna process a snapping turtle, you're gonna cut it the top and the bottom yep. carapace part. I'm good. You good? And it's just easier to get to all the meat that way. Well, instead, I wanted to keep it intact. So I'm like, you know, cutting in and I'm digging mm-hmm. the parts out. I had almost everything out. There was like one piece of vertebrae attached to the top of the shell yet and i went to go cut that one out my flay knife touched it and it snapped up to the top of that shell like hard like you know i was like whoa 
what the heck? And it kind of relaxed. I touched it again, did the same thing. It was only good for two. Yeah. Where's that power coming from? Like, there's, there was no muscles attached. Yeah. It was just that one vertebrae attached to the, you know, I suppose the Their spinal nervous systems collar, don't or die. spinal cord is still yeah. in the shell, you know. Yeah, their nervous systems don't die. It's and just crazy. It, 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 I, I can't say that I'm overly sensitive, but I don't like it when things are fighting me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. And it did. It was, it was like pushing back and trying to get yeah, away from weird. me. And I knew it was dead because it didn't have a head on it. Right. But the still rest, weird. yeah, the rest of that body was fighting me. Yeah, and it's still weird. But after I mean, that, I was like, I think if I'm hungry enough for turtle, I'll, I'll pay the money to just it. buy it. You know, <laughs> Let somebody you know? do the dirty. Work. Yeah, exactly. Because I didn't enjoy that portion of it. I'll still do it. I can't say that I enjoy it, but I'll do it. <coughs> you know, it yeah. needs to be done. To well, get to the it was the good. Final. I just don't know that it was so good. You yeah, know? no, I get that. Yeah, it's it's not it's not beaver good. I'm trying to no, uh, it's, definitely, <laughs> it's definitely not beaver good. But it is. I always heard the thing with turtles too, like all the different meats they had. I mean, I've heard like eleven. Yeah. It's, I don't think it's eleven, but seven. It's, it's it's a lot. Yeah, there's a bunch of different. And when ones I in got there. into it, I was like, "Holy crap! There really is all these different kinds of yeah. meat." And there's like a dark red meat, and there's yeah. like a pink, more chicken textured meat. Yep. Then there's like a white, flaky fish type meat. Yeah. I was like, "What is going?" And this is why you do a super stew because there's not enough of each any one of those types of meat to have its own meal. So you're like, yeah. I'll take it all, throw in a pot, some carrots, you're good to go. Yeah. You know, <laughs> basically. I barbecued some. Uh, I made general sows out of it. Uh, made oh. a traditional oh, turtle soup. Oh, it was delicious. Yeah. Uh, it worked really well for it, too, because uh, there's that technique called velvetting, uh, where you uh, an egg yolk and soy sauce and cornstarch, and you let it sit in that. And the cornstarch sort of helps break it down a little, and mm. you got all the other stuff in there with the soy, and it tenderizes the meat. That's why when you go to these Chinese places, you bite into, like, beef and chicken mm -hmm. and whatnot, and it just, just melts so because it just, they, they do this velveting huh. process to it. Got to look into that. Yeah, uh, and it works really, really well. And it, it's actually a really nice batter. So egg yolk, cornstarch, and, uh, like, sesame oil, and then soy sauce. And it makes a little, very light batter. And you soak it in that for a half hour, 45 minutes. And then deep fry it right out of that. It's like a batter, so you just throw it right in. And it's a very, very light, light, light crust. You know, hmm. it's not like a thick deep fry or anything. Work with goose. It works perfect. Oh, yeah. God, I'm about to try that. Yeah. Your plum chutney will be great on your oh, geese. Oh, my God. I can't <laughs> wait. It's going to be so good. Man. So how did you get into the cooking aspect of it. Did you go to uh, culinary school? No. No, no, no. I, uh, it, I, I've tried to trace it back and figure out, you know, what was it. And there's just a whole series of things that I guess sort of led me to this. Uh, when I was 16, uh, I remember coming home and, you know, 16 year old boy, I was active, uh, played sports, high school, had a job. Uh, I was hungry all the damn time. Uh, so I would come home and my mom, uh, mom and dad would, you know, have a pig or a cow in the freezer. And I remember my mom coming home and looking at me in just complete disgust <laughs> because it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I'm eating a, a T-bone steak. And she's like, what are you doing? I was like, I was hungry. She's like, T-bones are not an afternoon snack. And I'm like, well, you know, tomato, tomato. To who? Uh, <laughs> so we, my dad hunted. I hunted, uh, and I'm actually quite surprised I ever enjoyed wild game because the way they did things back then, uh, a lot of that wild game was terrible. Uh, Dad would shoot a deer in Montana, uh, put it in a trailer, a uh, trailer at home, oh, man. and then <laughs> it would get home. And I remember, uh, I must have been eight or nine, but I remember going out because he wanted everybody to see his deer he shot, go out to the trailer, and... You know, like that road slush and salt? Yeah. The whole thing was like candy coated in oh, that. Oh, my God. Uh, but he was just pleased as hell. Oh, so then, as yeah, so then he just pulled it into the garage and let it thaw. Uh, and like a week later, he took it to the butcher shop. <laughs> and, you know, oh we, you wonder why we didn't enjoy eating wild game. Oh. Uh, but we had killed the deer the one year, and typically all we ever did with deer was make pepper sticks or uh, summer sausage. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the one year I shot a deer, and I was like, can we, I was 15, I shot a deer, 
uh, and I was like, can we do something different? Could we get steaks and a few other, like, chops and whatnot? So when we took it to the processor, they got all that stuff. Well, then after the T-bone steak incident, Mom says, there's all that venison in there. Just eat it. I'm like, fine. So, okay, uh, deal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I started eating it. And I was getting out of here for the night, so would you like me to transfer you to another server, or I can close out with you now? What do we prefer? We'll close out now, and then we'll get a new yeah, lady. we'll get yeah. a new one. Sure, yep. together or separate? I'll take it. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Uh, so then, yeah, the... The, the venison then became my thing, and I started eating venison a lot. Uh, butter and Lowry salt. That's the only thing I knew about venison. You just yeah. butter and Lowry salt. And Probably how I got into it, too. <laughs> and then I was told, you know, you can't eat venison medium rare. or you got to cook it until it's they dead. Lied to you. Yeah, I know. Thank you very uh, much. Most of my life. They've lied to me. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was always a problem. This is why I have trust issues. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, when, when Grandma told me that you have to uh, boil a duck in salt water. For what? A, yeah, for an hour before you grill it. Uh, <laughs> These are terrible things. Yes, I know. I was an abused child. These are sins. Uh, so I, I remember going to football games, and before the football games, I would take venison with me and we'd grill and I'd Lowry season salt the hell out of it and grill it and then we'd eat it and it was good. And then I left for the Navy uh, and never thought about cooking. Uh, and then 96, uh, I was stationed in Japan and one of the guys that I was living with, Chris Moni, got a little homesick from time to time and a uh, thing that made him feel the best was to cook a big Sunday meal. So I'd sit down with him, and he'd cook, uh, and I'd hang out with him, and we'd drink wine and uh, end up with these big Italian feasts by the oh, end of it. Uh, and that. then one day I was like, hey, I, I saw this recipe in here. I think I'm going to cook it. So I started cooking. And then me and Chris, would, every Sunday, we'd cook a big meal, and everybody would come over, and we'd drink, you know, do what 22-year-olds do. <laughs> 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 uh, and it was fun. And then I got out of the Navy, and I came home, and... Uh, at that point in time, in 98, uh, Emeril Lagasse was big on TV, and I was entertained by it. So I watched his show, and uh, I started hanging out with Eric Passy down in Wabasha, and we were killing ducks, and, God, we were killing a lot of ducks. Uh, Eric would hunt 45, 50 days out of a 60-day duck season. I like him already. Yeah, uh, I'd get down there 35, 40 days. We'd kill 100 ducks apiece in a season, no problem. Nice. Uh, and... You're Again, a lot of duck. <laughs> I, what, I, what I knew about ducks yeah. was, oh, you gosh. know, uh, you got to boil them in water. <laughs> like my eyes are welling up. I know. Uh, oh, so man. then I was like, well, there's got to be other ways to do duck. And, of course, Emeril on TV was doing duck all the time. And I was like, God, that's nothing like Grandma was telling me. And then I went and I bought Emeril's book, uh, Louisiana Real and Rustic. And in it, it's, it's surprising because, like, I'd say 40% of the recipes in there are wild. Uh, hmm. And he probably doesn't use wild because you're not allowed to, but there's rabbits and ducks and geese and venison and uh, turtle in there and doves and pigeons and all sorts of other stuff. I was like, well, that's fascinating. And there were like eight duck recipes. So I was like, oh, I got to try all of these. Uh, and then I came across duck pastrami. Oh. And I was like, well, it seems complicated, and I didn't know what half the ingredients were. <laughs> so I had, you know, I'd never heard of an allspice berry. Right. Uh, so yeah. I had to start looking these things up, and then I found them, and uh, I made the uh, pastrami the first time, and my God, it was delicious. I got to uh, do that this year. Oh, yeah. It's, it's one of the best things you'll ever have. Uh, so I did the pastrami, and I, I tried all the others, and then... Uh, I know most people don't realize this, but we're old. Uh, back then, the Internet was pretty new. It did get carded. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, but the Internet was pretty new back then. But you could go online and you could look up recipes. And, God, I was finding these different recipes, and it was all new to us. So I started looking for wild game. And I, at that time, it was just ducks and geese I was cooking. Uh, but then I got back into deer hunting because of it. Uh, and... I went up and I shot some deer with some friends of ours up by uh, Warren, Minnesota. And I shot a deer and I was like, you know, all I knew at the time was you grind it up and you make pepper sticks and mm -hmm. summer sausage. Well, then all of a sudden there were other things to do with deer. And I was like, my God, this is all absolutely phenomenal. It's delicious. And it I actually has flavor, yeah. which beef doesn't. Right. 
so then I had to learn how to butcher. Uh, and I learned everything I know about ducks and geese from my grandmother, who, you know, she taught me a number of great things. Uh, how to pluck a goose, how to pluck a duck, uh, how to dip them in wax, how to do the whole nine yards. So I've always been a plucker and a waxer, and it's always worked really well for me. And then my uncle, you know, was a big hunter, so he showed me how to butcher a deer for the first time. And after that, I just started doing it all myself. And then before you know it, I was into it, and I was like, well, what else is there? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there were squirrels. That's how it starts. Uh, and... <laughs> I, I, I love squirrels. They are my favorite thing on earth. They're great. Uh, I, before I got here, I was off today, so uh, I was going to cook a little something. Um, when I do my squirrels, I do it a little different. I take the back legs off, and I'll save them in another pot, and then I put the whole body and the front legs and everything in okay. another. Well, you know, you're not cording them up. You're, leave, you're just taking the back yep, and everything just, else. Yep, everything else. The saddle else and the front legs. All and goes all into that. something else. So then I can get, you know, uh, a freezer container full of legs. Okay. So when I'm ready to, you know, fry them or grill them or do whatever, I can do drummies and whatnot, but then I've got the rest that I stew. Uh, so this morning uh, I braised out all the bodies, had five of them, uh, braised out all the bodies, picked all the meat, and then there's a Mexican cooking technique uh, and a recipe called tinga. And you take onions and garlic and uh, tomatoes, stew them down, and then I used uh, chipotle peppers and adobo uh, and then some uh, tomatillo salsa. And you stew that down until it's nice and thick like a gravy. And then you mix all that shredded meat back into it, and you make tacos. Oh, so I had squirrel God, tacos for lunch. So good. <laughs> oh, and, and squirrel tacos, oddly enough, were delicious. I think talking to you is just going to make me fatter. Well, I mean, I'm not fat now, but I mean, I, I feel like there's a chance now. But that's just sort of the, the this weird progression where, you know, it, it wasn't just uh, a thing. I met different people. Different people got me into it. Uh, you know, Eric Passy down in Wabasha, I credit him with all of my cooking skills because when you fill a freezer full of ducks and, you you know, I was... Got to get creative. I was dirt poor. Uh, you know, back in 98, I think I was making four and a quarter at the yep, liquor store. That's what it was. You know, yeah. and, and you don't live off that. No. <laughs> Yeah, all these people want fifteen dollars an hour, four and a quarter. Yeah, <laughs> that's like. Whew. But I, I ate a lot, lot of money. duck. I ate a lot of duck, and then you know when you figure out all the other aspects of cooking, uh, you know you take the carcass after you cooking a whole duck or a whole goose. Uh, it never really turns out the way you want it. But if you pluck the whole duck or goose uh, or any of your wild game birds, if you pluck them whole and then quarter them out and section them out after that. You end up with a better product. Yeah, they cook a lot. You know, you end up with those great goose breasts that have that thick skin and fat on it, and that gets nice and crisp in a cast iron pan, and then you throw it in the oven and roast it for 15 minutes, and you get this rare to medium rare with that mm. crispy, like almost bacon-like skin on the outside. Uh, it's, it's perfect, but then you've got a carcass. And what do you do with those carcasses? You know, roast them. Throw some herbs in there. Uh, some stock. Yeah, uh, yeah, carrot, onion, potatoes, celery, whatever you got, make stock. And then you take that stock, and what do you do? You got stocks that you can use for stews, risotto, any of the other things that you want to use stock for. Reduce it all the way down. Mm -hmm. Make a gloss oh, out of it. And when just you do it, the bones come out. They're white yeah. and just clean. <laughs> they, like, dry off in an instant. Yeah. And you know you've used every bit that you could. And you've got this thick, beautiful, oh, rich, so gelatinous yeah. stock uh, that you can add to anything. Uh, it's so I did, like, perfect. Um, something similar. So my my how I got into cooking, and I'm <laughs> not even quite. When I met you and I started looking at your Instagram, I'm like, oh my god, this guy is like so much better. <laughs> but I mean, I can cook okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, you know, eating out of a box, not of bags, pretty much a whole life. Neither one of my parents could cook very well. My dad was good at like fried chicken. He was okay with steaks. And baked potatoes mm -hmm. and fish and fried, you know, just your regular your standard like cornmeal fried fish. My mom couldn't really cook anything. Like we had a, the running joke, she's never burnt a thing in her life, but she's caramelized the hell out of a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> just not a good cook. So I didn't learn how to cook. So I'm eating, you know, prepared stuff out of a box or out of a can or out of a bag, just dead water, those kind of butter noodle kind of things. Yeah. And I don't even know how I kind of made the transition. I think we were out to eat, and I had something that would just tasted great, and it didn't. It seemed pretty simple, and I had the, like, 
I feel like I could do this. And then thanks to Google, you know, I pulled up like <laughs> recipe for whatever restaurant, you know, copycat recipe for whatever restaurant and whatever dish it was and looked and like that seems pretty easy. Made it in the kitchen. I was like, well, this, that was pretty easy. Mm-hmm. And for a fraction of what we just paid to have, yeah. And I'm in control of the ingredients. So that was kind of like my gateway drug. But then I was got into hunting later, too. And, yeah, same thing. I, when I was cooking my ducks well dead. They are tough, dry, gamey. But I was eating them because I had to. I mean, I yeah. loved. I was obsessed with duck hunting. So it's like, well, if I'm killing these things, I have to eat them, you know. And then, yeah, I started to learn that medium rare is the way to go with these I tell you, the very just first even time. Even pan frying them just like a steak. Yeah, and meeting and just cooking them into medium rare was a was a game changer. Right, the very first time I took a, a, a I think it was a wood duck, uh, and wood ducks are my absolute favorite ones to eat. I, love uh, I took a wood duck breast and I seared it with a little butter and garlic salt, and like maybe a minute and a half on each side, and then I cut that thing up and I ate it. And I I honestly I took a piece of it, brought it over to my roommate, and I said, "Here, try this." And he ate it and I said, "What does that taste like?" And he's like beef I'm like yeah yeah okay that's a duck <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was so delicious oh, juicy yeah and, tender. and, and just that uh, medium rare rare so uh, yeah it's fantastic uh but i mean i i do it all the time too and i i eat everything yeah, and if know? i can if if there's fat on the birds like right now like the geese mm-hmm. we shot in this early season there's no. zero fat on them so it's <coughs> no point to pluck them really yep but I then it's like this was actually relatively recent, a few years ago. Watching Anthony Bourdain, who, if you saw the episode where he was in Arkansas, he yeah. went a duck hunt. They didn't do very well, but they shot a couple of them. And the guys that he's with, they were kind of like they're like, well, if you know a way to make these things taste good, we're all about it because we've tried every which way and we don't really care for them. We right. don't have to eat them, but and we don't really. And, and very and, simple, yes, butter, too, like less salt, is pepper. More. Yeah. yeah, and just skin side down yep. on medium heat until that skin is just crisp. And then flip it once, let it sit for a minute, and you're good. For yeah, yeah. like thirty <laughs> seconds, because that that side without the fat yeah. cooks like that, and then you don't want to overcook it. And you right. take it off, and I'm a couple things struck me in the, on that episode is like you said, you know, skin side down, render all that fat out till it's crispy, flip it over, blah blah blah, you're done. And he was like, I'm just making a point. I'm going salt, pepper, and just a little bit of garlic powder, j- just to make a point. And he's like, I don't understand this about these guys. They have like literally the best meat on the planet yeah. with duck and they're claiming they don't like it like i just i gotta train because these. their grandmother boiled <laughs> in salt water <laughs> <laughs> exactly before they she just, grilled it <laughs> just lied to our whole lives <laughs> um but then the one thing that he stressed was like and for god's sake let that thing rest yeah and what a difference that makes yes it's like even doing all those things and if you just kind of knew it it would still be better it would than any duck that you had up to that point. But when you let it rest just for the five minutes, All it that just goes to that right top level. And, and it's, you're golden. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. It's just so good. And and I, it's a constant, even today, it's a constant argument I have with people in the field or just people I work with. They're like, well, you have goose. I'm like, ah, I used to goose something to get out of it. It's just, I just don't like it. I'm like, what are you talking about? It is delicious. Yeah. Well, they just... You cook things poorly. Yeah, and I have and the I so t- I go tell him how have you cooked it, and then they tell him like that's yeah. no wonder you don't like it. Yeah, that's that's just, you just described a disgusting meal to me. Yeah, and I, like, I go through the same thing with fish. You know, I'm I'm so tired of you know breading. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm so. My tired. wife likes breading. She likes the crunch of the breading. I do too. Uh, I, I truthfully, I mean, fried fish to me is not really all that exciting. It's not. It's it's a it's a vessel to get Hellman's tartar sauce in my mouth. You're eating chips. And and that's what I want is the Hellman's tartar <laughs> sauce. Uh, but you don't make your own tartar sauce? Well I do, but yeah, Hellman's yeah, tartar yeah, sauce yeah. every now and again is the best thing. I should have brought you my zucchini relish. Uh, we grew some beautiful zucchinis this year and uh, that relish there's jalapeno and zucchini and uh, onion in there with uh, turmeric and uh, mustard. And celery seed. And it's just a beautiful relish. But you mix that in with your mayo, uh, a little bit of lemon, and just a pinch of Old Bay, Ooh, and it's good. the best tartar sauce on earth. You know, a substitute, I don't know if it would be a perfect substitute. Um, 
so I also dabble in like not just wild mushrooms, mm-hmm. but like wild green foraging too. Yeah. It's like you're familiar with wood sorrel. Yeah. That's really lemony yep. in flavor. I've always wondered if you could like take some of that and crush it up and get enough to like substitute for a, so like a lemon zest. Your, so what you do with your wood sorrel. Oh, see, this guy knows. <laughs> I should have known better. Is uh, <clears throat> whatever fish you have, uh, classic recipe, I forget the uh, guy, but ancient French chef. Uh, classic recipe is to take sorrel and saute it with a little bit of butter and then heavy cream. So you end up with like a lemon cream. God, that sounds so good. Okay. And then whatever your fish is, uh, real thin sheets. So if you had walleye or panfish or whatever, it would work really well. And then just saute in butter real fast with a little bit of salt. And then you just let that float in the middle of your lemon cream that you made with that sorrel. And it's just, it's unct- oh, unctuous is the only word that comes to mind. <laughs> uh, it's delicious. Uh, God, but, I knew I was going to like this episode. Yeah, but everybody, <laughs> everybody gets crazy about the fried fish. Uh, I, I'm not a walleye guy. Uh, you know, I can take it or leave it. Yeah, I prefer northern. Uh, they're a better fish to me. Uh, I actually, you know, if I had to eat fish, it would be perch. Uh, they're just the best tasting perch of all of them. Uh, you know, catfish I love, uh, but everybody gets hung up on walleye, and they all want it fried, and they all want it, you know, one way. Uh, I took walleye uh, and substituted walleye in for a, a Caribbean recipe and made a tropical curry uh, with a coconut fried rice. Uh, and the number of people that told me I was an absolute idiot uh, because, <laughs> the, you know, why, why would you, why would you ruin yeah. a good fish? Right. Like, what, what are you talking about, ruin? Yeah, it's I just, delicious. <laughs> I elevated it. I just, I just took your walleye and made it into something much better. You know, I have, if I could say, most Americans, but mo- definitely upper Midwesterners yeah. like their food as bland as possible. One way. The reason, like, if you, when you talk to them, like, oh, I like this fish and I like that fish, it's because it doesn't taste like anything. Right. Walleye doesn't taste like anything. No. Crappies don't taste like it. was like, oh, I love crappies. They're so good. No, you love the breading and the seasoning <coughs> you put yeah. on it. Like, they don't, they don't have a flavor. And even to, even to the extent, like, that's why people like beef, and they might be not as big on wild game. Mm-hmm. You have to impart flavor into beef. Unless you're talking like some Wagyu or something that's, yeah. you know, like well, insane marbling. And listen, I'm not going to pass up a good ribeye. Yeah. Because it's got a lot of fat in it. I it like tastes it. great. But like a sirloin? Mm-hmm. Eh. But I'd, I'd eh. read an article, and I think it was Ranella who wrote it. Uh, ah, what would he know? Yeah, uh, one or two things, maybe. <laughs> uh, but... Everybody says that things taste like chicken. You know, when they want to describe, oh, it tastes mm-hmm. like chicken. Uh, but he was saying that it, everything tastes like corn. And the reason everything ah, tastes like corn is because that's what we feed yeah, everything. Yeah, we feed everything corn. Your beef, your chicken, your pigs, uh, even the fish that we get, most of our farm-raised fish are fed a diet. All those chicken corpses that we don't know what to do with after they peel all the meat off, they grind all yep. that bone up, they mix it with corn, and they make food pellets and feed it to all these fish. farm fish. You know, I've, I've, I have read, it's a separate thing, but I read an article somewhere down the line long ass time ago, but how, like, on, like, a, our DNA yeah. has, like, there's so much corn mixed into our DNA because we just, like you said, we consume it's in everything. The vegetable oil, yeah. you know, corn oils, corn starch, high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. Like corn is in everything. Yeah, it literally is in everything. Yeah, and if you if you read the it's history even in your of wild corn, game, if you're yes. eating deer Ex- anywhere, uh, anywhere in farmland, here, yeah, <laughs> uh, except where I hunt, uh, they're, they're full of soybeans and sugar beets. <laughs> mm. You're a Northwest guy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, Do you find uh, a flavor profile different? With that? Um, I don't know. I, I to, really you'd don't. You'd have to do like a side by side, yeah. really basic salt pepper taste. I'm, I'm also not a an ager. Uh, I don't like to hang meat and age it. Well, it doesn't really seem to make sense with wild game because it doesn't have the fat. Yeah, I uh, the way I look at it, I don't have proper facilities for it. And my garage certainly isn't the right spot yeah, to age meat. Need, well, yeah, and you need a specific temperature. Yeah. And, and I've probably I've, humidity level and all that yes, stuff exactly. needs to be controlled. Uh, temperature and humidity are huge. Uh, but I've listened to so many people tell me, oh, no, no, no. I hang that deer until a layer of mold grows oh, on that's it. that's just and dumb. then and You're then cutting I, away a good yeah, inch of meat. That's what I'm 
my big problem with it is that you're losing so much meat. Well, these like 90 day age steaks that you yeah. get at these expensive, you know why that thing is $65 for a six ounce cut? It's because there's yeah. none left. Because it was a 14 ounce cut. Yeah. And they now it's a six ch- ounce yeah, cut. Yeah, trim off eight <laughs> ounces of rot to get yeah. to the part that wasn't rot. Or just dry, uh, you know, when it dries out so badly. And yeah, the, the flavors intensify a bit, but uh, it just, I don't know. I, I would prefer to eat all of my deer, not just part of my deer. So I usually butcher everything within 24 hours. I do hang it, and I will let it come out of rigor. Because in that 12-hour window, you know, Mm -hmm. if it goes into rigor and you butcher it in rigor, there's some research that shows your meat will be tougher. Hmm. And it stays in rigor in the freezer. What's that thing that you can do? It's like a a shock thing that you can, like, shock the rigor out? Apparently. Apparently there's... I've heard something about uh, it. I haven't looked into it Somebody selling some sort of device out there that does that. Uh, Weird. But... I if I shoot a deer, I'll leave it overnight. Otherwise, if it's really warm out, and you know, in the last ten years, there's been a number of deer seasons where it's seventy five degrees. Yeah, you don't have the yeah. Luxury. I just I'll shoot it and butcher it in the same hour. Yeah, I've uh, done I've done that. Um, and well, if you can do that, just out of a time, it's like I'm not gonna have time tomorrow, so right. I'm gonna have to stay up late and get this done. If you can do that, it's fine. But once a deer, you know, if you're not gonna butcher it right away, once a deer reaches that rigor mortis stage let it hang for another 12 hours until it softens and then once it softens butcher it and you're good to go but that's about the extent of your aging yeah, in air quotes. Uh, yeah of what i'll do now if i had you know a, a chamber that was temperature and humidity controlled i wouldn't mind trying it but probably not on a deer an yeah, elk just, or a moose where you got gonna, a little bit more meat I mean, to deal with this is bro science but i I'm pretty sure the aging thing has to do with, like, the fat. Like, as the fat kind of breaks down and it gets and the muscle fibers break mm-hmm. down, like, the fat kind of dissolves into the meat fibers. So you get a juicier, tender, yeah. you know, like, evenly flavored piece of meat throughout. I, th- I think that's the science yeah. behind it. <coughs> well, a deer doesn't have that fat, so I don't know what you're doing well, by the aging. Fat on I mean, deer. I guess maybe the fibers are still breaking down a little they bit. They do, yeah. Uh, um, it, that's natural. You know, the longer you leave it, the more it'll tenderize. Uh, but the fat on a deer isn't edible. Uh, I don't know, I'll tell you, uh, you know, and this is probably a lie too, but I've, I've always done it as tradition, take those tenderloins out and I pretty much eat those for my meal after a successful mm-hmm. hunt. And those definitely haven't been aged yeah. at all. No, nope. It's usually s- still warm when I, I throw very it in the pan. Rarely, very rarely will I ever eat a tenderloin. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, anywhere that I've ever hunted, uh, I, I cut them out and give them to whoever I'm with. Really? Yeah. Uh, they're a small piece of meat. They're yeah, co- it's not a lot. They're, they're coveted by a lot of people. Uh, they're not that important to me. So I'll butcher it, cut them, clean them up, and I usually give them to the landowner. And they're usually happy as pigs and shit yeah. to get them. Yeah, I'll the, give them they, to the they landowner do have I'm that hunting on. or mystique about them. Yeah. But when I eat them, they're good. But it's like you said, they're not. it's not particularly better than any other cut. I mean, a backstrap. They're they're usually paler, so they must not yeah. have as much blood, or it's a different kind of muscle. It's not used, obviously. It's not it's, used it's the same not way. Used. So yeah, that's the whole um, problem. Probably why it's tender, but it definitely doesn't yeah. have as much of that venison flavor, which I like. Yeah, that like a backstrap would have. I'm a heart guy. So. Oh. I go right for the heart. Hell yeah. yes. <laughs> yep. The yeah. I can't believe people leave that in the gut pile. Oh, I I like it. You I know. do too. Uh, I like that they leave it. Uh, <laughs> I love it. It's, uh, it's honestly, it's my, it's like, probably, it's probably my favorite cut. I, I mean, I, it's right up there. I have a lot of friends, uh, and they all just, for whatever reason, aren't into it. So there's not a year that goes by that I don't end up with a dozen hearts <laughs> oh, in my freezer. Very nice. <laughs> and, oh, nice. And they just they save the heart. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. You know what? What I haven't dabbled in, and I need to, is because you know your taste buds change. But I've. Growing up was not fond of liver, and I've saved a couple of venison livers, but I haven't yet brought myself to actually eat them. <laughs> Break yourself in. Don't, don't I'm go. Gonna, I'm going to have to do it. Don't go straight for, like, fried liver. Uh, make sausage. Okay. Um, there's a sausage called mazza fagetti. <coughs> I'll forget that. Yeah, you will. <laughs> uh, just sneeze real loud and put an eddy at the end. And be uh, Italian. Yeah. Uh, Mazza spaghetti is a northern Italian sausage. Well, it makes uh, some of that Maserati spaghetti. Exactly. James talking uh, about. It's traditionally made with pork, uh, but it's liver, fat, and meat. Uh, and then it's seasoned with sweet things. Uh, orange zest, uh, 
pine nuts, uh, Moscato wine, uh, but it makes a real sweet sausage. Uh, really, really delicate because liver is very delicate. Mm-hmm. Do it with a deer. Just take deer, some pork fat, and your deer liver, grind it all together, uh, season it up, and you've got this beautiful sausage that then you, you know, very lightly grill, brush with butter, throw it on a bun with some sautéed peppers, and you've got just a delicious mm, sausage. Sounds good. How about like a, could I do like a brown schwager, like yeah. a pate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, Amy Thielen has a book, um, God, what is it, Midwest, uh, I forget the name of the book. Something about the Midwest. I thought you were good with names. I am. Well, I got the name. I just didn't get the book. <laughs> yeah, you got the uh, author's name. <laughs> uh, she's got a Brunschweiger recipe in her book that is phenomenal, and I've done it with deer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the different pâtés, uh, very simple. Uh, but the thing with most of your game liver pâtés, they can be potent. But if you mix in uh, cream cheese, oddly enough, hmm. uh, it kind of cuts that potency down okay. a little bit. It makes them really smooth and delicate, uh, adds to the texture, uh, makes them real creamy and you know nice, but also sort of dulls down the uh, intensity uh, of the liver. The, 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 the culinary joke would be the awful flavor. Yeah, exactly. Spelled differently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, soak your, cube them up. And then soak them in uh, port wine and pink salt. Uh, and then all you got to do is sear them in a pan and put them in a blender and hmm. so pulse it down. You're searing the liver. The liver, yep. You whole or you cubed it up? Right? Yeah, you cubed just, it up okay. uh, and then uh, marinate it. Uh, take port wine and pink salt, uh, some sort of curing salt that's got the extra nitrates in it. Okay. Uh, cure it. Let it sit for, I don't know, a couple hours overnight. Uh, and then just saute them in butter, and once they're all cooked, then throw them into your food processor and pulse them down. Add a little bit more seasonings to it, some white pepper, nutmeg, uh, and then your cream cheese, and then pulse it, pulse it, pulse it, and then push it through a mesh sieve. You end up with a really smooth liver. I need to get all Uh, these things. I don't have, like, an emulsifier. I don't have, like, a sieve. I need to get all these things. You got a food processor, don't you? I do. I have a KitchenAid. Yeah, that's all you need. Yeah, I, got a, I don't know what kind of attachments I got for it. I got a meat grinder attachment. I know yeah. that. Works perfect. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Just use the smaller hold yeah. thing on yeah. it. And then once you cook it, you know, uh, and grind it through that thing, you can push it through a, you got just a regular strainer, a metal strainer. Just push it through there and take a spatula and just keep going and you'll get all that. And then any of the little uh, connective tissues and arteries and stuff we'll just be left uh, behind. will be left behind. Hmm. And you get a real smooth product and you just... Put that in a little bowl and serve it with crackers. My, my wife is a huge fan of Braunschweiger, so yeah. she might be into that. I love Braunschweiger. Uh, I, I, I like it all right. I'm not like I, I made it with buffalo a couple of years ago. A uh, buddy of mine shot a buffalo. I uh, shot two buffalo. Uh, and then he brought them back, and he, he's like, do you want the liver out of this thing? I'm like, sure, why not? So he brought me two livers. How big were, are those? Uh, 12 pounds a piece. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> So, so I was working on liver for a while, wow. and I had a number of different recipes that I had to try out with liver. Buffalo liver was good. Uh, you know, it was good enough that you could just uh, dredge it in flour and fry it in butter and serve it with a little grainy mustard, and you're good to go. Do, have you done just like our regular liver and onions with venison yeah. liver? Is it yeah. is it pretty potent? I mean, is um, it, um, so. It's it's funny about it because again it's all about the cooking method. Sure, I'm uh, not. you know, a buddy of mine. Don't doubt that for a second. I, I was telling a buddy of mine, Jeremy, uh, that venison liver is very good. You just, you know, cut it pretty thin, fry it on each side, and then serve it with a little brown mustard. And you know, if you want to do some bacon and onions, do that too. So he does it, and he just looks at me, and he's like, "Man, that was awful." <laughs> and I was like, "Really?" He's like. I don't know what it was. It was just, it was grainy and mealy. I've got some left over if you want to try it. And I was like, okay. So he pulls it out and he'd cut it like an inch thick oh. uh, and and cooked it. And I was like, oh, see, here's your problem. <laughs> uh, you got to cut that stuff like, you know, a quarter inch thick or an eighth inch, real thin, as thin as you possibly can cut it. Uh, and then dredge it in flour and give it a hot sear. But like 30 seconds. You're not seconds. really cooking it, cooking it. No. You're, you're browning that batter on each side and you're Barely. done. You know, it's a tss, tss, and you're done. Because liver cooks fast. I it's, bet cause it's really soft. Well, it's all iron. Yeah. You know, and iron conducts heat. <laughs> well. 
and and it just it it cooks fast. But if you do it real quick, you get a tender piece of meat. I mean, I did that. People on this podcast have already heard it, but I made uh, snow goose tacos. I just made yeah. some Canada goose tacos here just the other the week, and the same thing. I cut those really thin along the bias, mm-hmm. and I'm flash cooking them. Yeah. I mean, the pan's hot, the butter's in there, the garlic is brown, and I throw it in there, and I just toss it until it's mostly brown on all sides. Some of them are still pink, it doesn't matter, because yeah. it's going to get thrown back into the taco sauce slurry, you know, at the very end anyways. But then I take it out, and I just let that rest while I'm, you know, sautéing the onions and getting everything else ready. And when the when it reduces down with the rest of the taco seasoning in it, the meat goes back in there. You just, mm-hmm. until it's hot, kill the heat, boom, you're eating. I mean, it's super quick, and it's yeah. so tender. I had some left over the next day for work. It was just in a Tupperware container, and one of my coworkers, you know, he was one of these guys that said he doesn't like goose. I remembered that, so I'm like, I'm like, here, try some of this. He's like, oh, I'll try some. He put it in his mouth. He started chewing it. And you could see on his face, like, like, what did you do to this? I'm like, yeah. not much. He he wanted to not like he it. He wanted to not like it, but it, <clears throat> and then, yeah. so the, like, I just worked him with him again after not working with him for a couple weeks, and he was we had, so I was having this goose doesn't taste bad yes it does conversation yeah. with a separate guy and he overheard and he's like listen he brought this stuff the other week and i didn't think i liked goose either and this stuff was phenomenal so you just need to try it yeah <laughs> it's like i'm telling uh, you i've had so many people swear they don't like it yeah. and then when i'm like when i cook it for them and i have them try it they're like this is amazing and every time like i didn't do anything to it yeah like i didn't all soaking it in milk soaking in italian i haven't done any of that none of it nope i just cooked it I just treated it. Do like you do the legs well. and thighs? Uh, I don't usually, okay. um, but I do want to. This year, I am gonna. I am going to braise some thighs. Yeah, do the same tacos yeah. with uh, legs and thighs. You get a completely different uh, product. Oh, I bet. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be interesting because you'll enjoy it more. Oh, I, uh, I'm sure I will. The, the tendons and the connective tissue in the legs and thighs, unlike the breast, um, that's the issue with wild game. There's nothing in there to keep the meat moist. Uh, so you have to add a bunch of stuff, mm-hmm. but like deer shanks, uh, leg and thigh portions of any of your game meat, they're full of connective tissue. And when you cook those down, that connective tissue turns to gelatin and it keeps the meat moist. Mm-hmm. And uh, a buddy of mine, Jack Hennessy, he uh, writes for a few other provocations. He's got a recipe for goose leg barbacoa. Mm-hmm. And those those legs, you know, a little orange juice and some chipotles go a long way. No, uh, I do want to do that because um, <coughs> I did venison shanks, I think, for the first time like two years ago. Yeah. Oh. Changes the whole way you think. Dude, they're so good. They are, yeah, it takes some time. Mm-hmm. Like, it, th- these things are cooking for a while, but yeah. it is so worth it. And, again, my wife, who when I first met her, swore up and down that she didn't like venison. She yeah. has come full circle with that, especially when I made these shanks. She yeah. just couldn't believe it. Are we married to the same woman? I'm just very possible. Yeah. I don't think so. She's uh, usually around when I'm around. But it's fine. My, I mean, yeah. Amanda said the same thing to me. She was just like, I I don't like it. I'm like, wait, well, again, uh, you probably never had it cooked right. Uh, to which she responded, well, my last boyfriend said the same thing. <laughs> and he cooked it right, and it tasted terrible. And I have probably 300 cookbooks at home, and I challenged her, uh, look through all of them. And Pick when you get you to like. the end, uh, yeah. if you find a single recipe that says, when finished, tastes like shit, uh, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> it, it doesn't exist. They're not supposed to taste bad. Should we, should we collaborate on a book? Get the title is, it does not taste like shit? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> When finished, does not taste like shit. There you go. It's a perfect book. I do have an idea for a book. And not that I'm a writer. I do like to write, um, but I don't. I'd like to write like more articles or like a blog. But when, like for my own blog, I write like one every four months. Yeah. I find it hard to <coughs> like. What am I going to write about? I don't like that. Like subject matter, I have a hard time finding subject matter. Yeah. Because things that might be interesting for somebody else or might be educational for somebody else can can sometimes and not to sound like egotistical but it could be like not elementary to me but something i don't really think of mm-hmm. it's like something i've done so often i don't put any real thought about it. it's almost like muscle memory at that point yeah it's like how do i go about writing that to where i'm not talking down to the reader 
you know. Okay, so, so I have a hard time finding subjects. I'm, I'm probably going to insult everybody, but that's good. Bring uh, it up. The vast majority of people don't know anything. That's true. Uh, so talking down to them, if you do it in a genuine manner and try not to be like, you know, uh, some snooty little priss that's yeah, well, trying to tell everybody that they're wrong. Everybody knows me. Was yeah. But I mean, if you just adjectives. if you're straightforward and you're you're honest about it, you know, uh, this is a duck, uh, and I was told this, and it isn't good if you do it this way. But I found that if you just sear it in a pan mm-hmm. with a little salt and pepper, throw a clove of garlic in there just to give it a little bit of flavor, serve it up pink, let it rest for five minutes. All of a sudden, you've got this delicious creature. And then my preferred little storytelling method. Is, you know, four or five paragraphs of how I got here. You know, what I, I was watching TV or mm-hmm. uh, my favorites are when my daughter decides it's time that I need to make something. You know, uh, she watched The Princess and the Frog, uh, Disney movie. And in the thing, talking about the, the prince and the princess and they go to see the old lady in the woods. And she says, gumbo, gumbo in the pot. Uh, we need a princess. What you got? Eleanor says, what's gumbo? And I'm like, well, gumbo is a stew that they make down south. She's like, well, do you make that? I'm like, I can. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So then uh, me and Ellie sit down and we make gumbo. And like now all of a sudden we've got, you know, a whole story about how to do that. Uh, And we make gumbo with uh, rabbits and duck. Uh, And then we all sit down and we eat it. And she's like, "Uh, that's awesome. It's delicious. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, it really is. is (laughs) It is. Uh, And you can do it with anything. Um, But. That's how I kind of come into these things is <clears throat> with that little story. With Outdoor Life, that's where I started. You know, uh, a simple little story about how I came into the recipe, uh, the results of the recipe, and then a recipe. Uh, and somewhere along the lines, that wasn't what they wanted, and they wanted to move to different things uh, as far as, you know, uh, top ten reasons why and yeah, uh, yeah, 11 there, best yeah, ways to do this. And, changing. Uh, and I, I didn't enjoy writing that anymore. It wasn't fun. Did um, did you approach them? Like, no. did you? Or they approached you. So I have you had fallen, obviously had already kind of. I have been fallen into else. everything I've done. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Uh, I, I've, well, how did they find you? I, I've joked quite a bit with my wife uh, that it would be amazing uh, to see what would have happened had I applied myself. <laughs> um, but I so. Years ago, uh, my buddy Rick Edwards uh, looks at me. He's like, you know, Jamie, you should really start writing these recipes down. Some of these are really good. Uh, And that's when blogging was kind of in. It was like 2009-ish. So I logged on to blogger.com, and I looked up how to start a blog. And then I was just going to keep track of my stuff that way. Uh, Had zero intention of anybody reading it. I'm not a good writer. Uh, I, I don't like to read what I write, and I don't do any of the other stuff. So I started writing uh, recipes, and if you go back and you like look through those first few, it's like, God, these are awful. <laughs> uh, but uh, the photography's awful. Everything's awful. Uh, and I, I wrote, and I wanted to get better at it. So there's a place down in Minneapolis called the Loft Literary Center, and I looked through their little catalog, and all they do is teach classes on writing. And they had a six-week class, uh, one day a week, uh, about food blocks. So I was like, oh, well, shit, it's right there. So I went and I took the class. And I learned quite a bit and was able to understand a little bit more uh, and started writing and kept writing. And then the lady who taught that class uh, became the editor of Simple, Good, and Tasty. And Simple, Good, and Tasty was she approached me and was like, you know, I really see what you're doing as a good fit to the whole sustainable uh, movement and, you know, locally grown everything Mm -hmm. uh, organic. Uh, And I was like, well, I see how it would fit into that category, so why not? So I wrote for them for a little while, and I was doing an article a month for them, and then I was trying to do two or three a month for my own blog, You Have to Cook It Right. And then that went on for a while, and... Uh, I had written a thing for them, uh, for Simple, Good, and Tasty, about cooking and eating coots. Which, again, all my life I've been told they're inedible. Don't go near them. They're not inedible, but they're not great. Well, it depends. (laughs) Uh, If you you take one and try to eat it, it can be a little off-putting. 
Uh, but if you remove the skin and all the fat and just sear a breast uh, with a little bit of butter and salt, uh, oddly enough, it tastes a lot like beef. Uh, now, so that's what I did. I wanted yep. to, I wanted to do this again. Once I started realizing that I've been lied to yeah. about almost everything my entire life as it pertains to food, then I started I'm like, oh, I'm going to try this. So I shot some coots, I brought them home, and I just did a side-by-side with I cooked them the exact same way. Yep. Just breast, no skin, no fat, just breast, breast. Mallard, coot. Okay, well, you can't compare different. the two. Okay. <laughs> uh, apples and apples, they are not. Distinctly yes. different. But not, I didn't think coot was off putting on its own. Uh, to me, it tasted very similar to a spoonbill uh, or any of your other or divers. Divers, yeah. 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 It, has, it has a diver flavor yep. to it, but not a canvasback flavor. No, right. Uh, so. Uh, I wrote that for Simple, Good, and Tasty, and then, I don't know, a few weeks after that, uh, Outdoor Life called, and they were like, hey, we're running an article about uh, swamp birds and some of the other less moorhens and mm-hmm. gadwalls, or gallinules, I guess they're. Gallinules, uh, however you say Yeah, uh, and coots, and, I, and they were wondering if they could use the recipe that I'd come up with. And I'm like, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, and the recipe I'd come up with, because... I may have gone overboard when I shot coots. <laughs> uh, I, 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 sh- I shot my limit and my buddy's limit. Well, uh, and 15 we, a piece. Yeah, so. and we had a whole pile of them. Uh, so I breasted them out and picked all the meat, and then I ground it up and I made sausage. And uh, there's a, another Italian sausage called Cotechino uh, with a vanilla. and Cotechino. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I called it. Uh, but... Uh, what you do then is instead of cutting fat into it, you boil pig skin. And when you boil the pig skin and grind it, you end up with this binder that holds okay. things together because it's very gelatinous mm-hmm. and it's got all that property to it. So I did the Cotagino, uh, and it was good. It was really good. Uh, and I made like 15 pounds of Cotagino. <laughs> uh, so I, I used it all the time. You serve it with lentils or uh, what I did, I made a, uh, a French dish. Uh, that you just basically pile all the meats in and you go to town. Uh, and it was good. Uh, so they wanted to run that. And uh, I just told the lady that had called, you know, if you ever need anything, uh, please reach out. I'd be happy to help. So I, I wrote for Simple, Good, and Tasty for a little while longer. And then I stopped because they were kind of going away. Uh, I continued to write for myself. And then one day, Outdoor Life called back, and they're like, hey, we're thinking about starting our own online blog. We're wondering if you'd be interested in contributing. I was like, yes, absolutely. So I started there and did that for like two and a half years, I think. Uh, And then, of course, in that process, I met another guy named Mark Norquist, who runs Modern Carnivore. And Mark and I hit it off, and we're both BHA guys, and... uh, We entered a cooking contest together, uh, did a whole bunch of other stuff, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, And then my blog and his blog, you know, it just seemed like a good fit together. So I stopped writing for mine, and I started writing for his. So I write for Modern Carnivore, uh, and that's pretty much exclusively what I'm doing right now is just for him. Uh, And then... Every now and again, I do a little side thing. Yeah, like a deadline. He's like, it's, it's pretty much. That's just the nice thing. We're both very, very lax. Uh, yeah, uh, See, but me, we're I very feel busy like people. I might actually do better with a deadline because they work. I would. It would yeah. I, I'm for stuff like this. It's like I would like to write more, but yeah. I'm not the greatest at self motivation. Right. So if I had someone that's like, listen, we need an article by Friday, the whatever twenty third. Yeah. Like. Okay, I'll get you one, and then Wednesday, the twenty first, I'll start writing. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's exactly me most of the time. <laughs> um, but I mean, but with, I just get too easily distracted by other things. Yeah, when it, when I'm left to my own devices. I mean, well, it's just, you got I think, a day off, and it's beautiful you outside, and it's like it's, I'm not sitting inside. I'm going fishing. Right, exactly. Uh, today was great. It rained, so I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I cleaned out freezers. I'm preparing yeah. for the. I have a wolf center not too far from my house. I just kind of went through, and anything that had a little bit of freezer burn on it, yeah. gone, and brought it down to the wolf center. So, yeah. no, it's it's I'm a ready very to stock it back up again. Very interesting thing. I mean, I I've tried it all, and the writing aspect has been very weird for me because I never considered myself as that. I failed every English class I took, uh, and it just somehow it seems to work and. Uh, when I took the class through the loft, the lady that taught it, Claire Sanford, she 
She just looked at me. She goes, I don't want you to take this as an <laughs> insult uh, because I don't mean it as an insult. But you have a very simple way of writing. It's very understandable. Uh, and, that could be good, and, especially and, for outdoor life readers. Well, and in this instance, you know, that's it's a very good thing. Because I want people to understand mm-hmm. that we don't have to boil shit and salt. <laughs> Please, uh, God, be, yeah. for the love of God, uh, stop. Not, not everything has to be breaded and fried. Uh, there are endless amounts of possibilities that we can do. Yeah, I'll take crappies uh, and, you know, panfish, and I'll do tacos with those, too. Yeah, Egg and by all ta- means, you know, do not like cut tostada, the front. Not a taco, but, like, you know, an yeah. open-faced tostada. Do not cut the legs off your deer and throw them to the dog because those shanks Never are again. the very best thing yes. on that deer. Honestly, you know? they probably are. <laughs> like, seriously, like, when I did it, it was so amazing. I yeah. just couldn't believe it. Well, like, I mean, we've all made deer stews. in your mouth. We've made the, deer stews with regular yeah. cuts, and yeah. the meat's always a little dry. Mm-hmm. You know, even though it's been sitting there in right. a liquid the whole time, you're kind of like, mm-hmm. yep. and it's not, it's not overly enjoyable. It can be, but it's not. Uh, and then you do that same stew with shank meat, and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> what just happened here? It's all that connective tissue that something just melts has down. changed. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, and it it's makes. Phenomenal. I mean, the gravy that comes out of that oh, God, yeah. mixed with like the bone marrow and everything else yeah. it's like it's so incredibly rich i mean you yeah. do that and some mashed potatoes and then you know oh, yeah. Yeah. make a gravy out of the what's ever left in the pan and you eat all that stuff together i did it with goose legs that last year is a uh, food gasm right there take those goose legs and uh you know similar flavors garlic thyme and then uh last year i was hunting with eric and after we got done hunting uh, he had a friend that has an apple orchard, so we went over to his buddy's place, and we were pressing apples for juice. He sent me home with eight gallons of apple oh cider. Oh, my God. I was like, God, it's, I've, I've never done that before, so it was a lot of fun. Well, then I wanted to incorporate that with the geese we shot mm-hmm. earlier that day. So then I stewed the goose legs uh, with garlic, thyme, and apple cider and just cooked it down and cooked it down and cooked it down until the goose legs just fell apart. And you shred that meat up, serve it over some mm. mashed potatoes, God. and a little bit of this, like, sweet, like, gravy sauce that's mm-hmm. on there. God, it's phenomenal. Yeah, no, I'm definitely going to do that this year. And, I mean, even, like, noodle dishes. Um, I started getting into making my own noodles yeah. recently because it's really not that hard. Yeah. And I don't even have a noodle maker. Like no. a noodle, I need to get one, though, because I used one. My sister had one. We used it this uh Summer for our little family get together, and mm-hmm. yeah, that was a lot better. Yeah, well, you've <laughs> got a KitchenAid mixer. If you've yeah. got a KitchenAid mixer, yeah. they sell an attachment. Yeah. Those runner. attachments aren't cheap either. No, they're not. Why, why is the attachment yeah. that expensive? I don't understand. Craig's but I do need to eBay. get it. I need to get it because it, it was yep. like it shortened down the time. Yeah. Like Otherwise, immensely. just those hand crank ones yeah. that you can get for like nineteen. Yep, that's what I used. Yeah, it, and it was that one works perfectly. It was nice. Yeah, um, but using like um, heritage grains, it's like just not. It just makes for such a better noodle. You don't, like, when you eat it, you don't have that heavy, I just ate too much pasta. It's an interesting thing noodle. Because it, it actually, a dried noodle that, when you dehydrate a noodle back down to the dry and then rehydrate it, you end up with this weird thing. Uh, a fresh noodle that you just made, uh, you boil it for like a minute and a half, mm-hmm. and it's done. Yeah, cook super quick. And it, it's, it's perfectly done. And they hold sauce better, and it works that's better. So and it, yeah. It's so good. And I when mean, you, like, so I, in the spring, I usually pick 10 or 15 pounds of nettles. Uh, and then saute all those nettles down, puree them, pack them into ice cube trays. Not only in the spring? Because yeah, there's still typically. plenty of nettles right now. There are, but, but they're a pain in the ass. Okay, do you find that the leaves are too tough now? No, or? the leaves aren't tough. The stalk is. Oh, okay. Uh, and the stalk gets real woody this time so, of so year. So you're using the stalks and everything oh, in the yeah, spring? Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, okay. Yeah, when they're about 18 inches tall, everything's tender. Uh, so you can just pick off. I usually just pick off, like, the top six inches. Okay. Uh, take all of it home, and then you can saute all of that because it's real tender and easy. Mm, uh, in the fall here when they're, you know, five feet tall, that stalk is woody, and you got to strip them off and stripping leaves off of nettles. Uh, Wear gloves. Even then, <laughs> you know, they sting you through the damn gloves. Uh, but in the spring I do it, and I get it all done, and then I've got nettles for the whole season. I, I puree everything, put it into ice cube trays, freeze them, and then pop those nettle ice cubes out. Okay. And all it is is puree. Uh, and then I can vacuum seal those. And you take two or three of those little ice cubes, mix it with flour, egg, uh, and a little bit of water maybe, but there's enough water in the nettle, and you make pasta. 
okay. or you do oh, potatoes, potatoes, egg, flour, uh, and a few of those cubes and make gnocchi. And you end up with just these brilliant green, wonderfully tasting uh, gnocchi and pastas. I do really enjoy the flavor of nettle. Yeah. I mean, if green was a flavor, it, it tastes it, green. It's nettle. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. but, but, they, but it, really good. Like, yeah. I'll throw them in my salads. I mean, yep. um, you know, you just give them a quick bath, you yeah. know, in like lukewarm water and those needles you ever fall had off or whatever. Spinach? And I just throw them right on my salad and eat it. Creamed spinach? Yeah. I don't think so. Old-fashioned dish they serve at most of the supper clubs, and you get it alongside your ribeye steak or your prime okay. rib on Saturdays. Uh, I did it with nettles. Uh, basically, you're just sautéing nettles in butter, adding heavy cream and nutmeg, and cooking it down until it's you know a little thicker. Phenomenal. Do you use uh, so I'm going off of the weeds I have at my house yeah. of, that are prolific, like yeah. uh, pigweed, or what? What's pigweed's actual name? That's um, Never heard of it. Because if I say the real word, you'll probably go, oh, <laughs> that. Because um, there's a domestic version of it. Oh, I just had it. I'm going to have to go to the Google. But uh, lamb's quarter? Yeah. Do you, lamb's quarter is really good for salads. Do you incorporate that into any dishes or have you? Any of the wild greens I can get. You so know, you got the, probably do the same thing yeah. with nettles as you do with Well, I, as I've, far as I've never really eaten. The noodles. Yeah. Amaranth. Ha ha. I didn't amaranth. even have to yeah. I didn't even have to look it up. There you go. Amaranth. Yeah, amaranth is good. I tried collecting the seeds. That's a pain in the ass. Yeah. yeah. Very small. Trying to get the chafe off. You ever collect so acorns? Just, like, oh no, but yeah, my you want to talk uh, about a pain in the yeah, ass. Yeah, my brother um <laughs> her brother in law, there was some video that was passed around, it's an ancient video. Mm-hmm. Um that was passed around on Facebook recently about some uh, old Native American woman that was proud that did the whole thing yeah and he's like oh we should try that start collecting acorns <laughs> you start collecting acorns yeah. i don't want any part of this <laughs> um, <laughs> you probably read the book when you were a kid my side of the mountain i don't think so uh, i didn't do a ton of book reading when okay. i was a kid <laughs> uh, it was one of those books that uh you know kid runs away from home moves off into the catskill mountains out east and he's gonna live by himself you know climbs a cliff and Gets a baby hawk out of the nest and trains it to hunt and does oh, all these Jesus. things. Yeah, so it's an interesting little book, and it's a kid's book. Uh, but in there, uh, he makes acorn pancakes with acorn flour. And it always intrigued me, and I always thought that would be fun to do. And I finally got around to doing it. And boy, is that labor is intensive. not fun? <laughs> uh, picking and shelling acorns. You can get away with it. It's pretty easy if you do certain things to it. You know, if you take all your acorns and freeze them, uh, then you can just crack them with a hammer, and the 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 meat comes out. But then after you get all that done, but you still got to uh, leach the tannins you still got to leach all the tannins yeah. out. Yeah. So then you got to blend them in water and let them rest and change and do that several times, and then you got to dry it, and then you got to grind it, and you got to get it fine and. It was a process. Uh, How were the pancakes? Uh, delicious. Yeah. I, I Worth enjoy, it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, He's honest, ladies and but, gentlemen. <laughs> but, I mean, in, any time you spend uh, a week uh, preparing pancakes, yeah, they're hear, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> the, so, going back to the Grizzly Adams things, now, I have always wanted to do uh, the cattail flapjacks. Yeah. And I always thought it was the fluff. Yeah. Which it's not. No. Once I started looking into it, it's the pollen that yeah. you get in the spring or early summer or whenever yep. they bloom. Um, then yeah. I started reading into how to actually do that. And I'm like, well, that also sounds like a mind labor pain intensive, in the day. Because yeah. there's tons of bugs and everything else yeah. in there you got to get out. And, and I haven't messed around with a whole lot of And you of still pollen. have to mix it with flour. Yeah. Well, yeah. what do you. That, You're just as imparting. As soon as I read that, that part, I'm like, all right, that's just dumb. No, yeah. no, it's not. I mean. I watched. Uh, because apparently uh, pine cones are now kind of an interesting thing to me because uh, you can you can harvest pine pollen uh, and use it in a similar way. Really? Uh, and uh, most of the pine trees that we have around here, there are edible parts of. Uh, when pine cones first come out, they're just tiny and green. Mm-hmm. Apparently they're edible. Uh, you can candy them. You can eat them like that. Uh, Rene Redzepi out of uh, Denmark uh, was barbecuing pine cones uh, and eating them like corn on the cob. Really? Yeah. 
Uh, I've yet to try that. Hmm. Uh, I figured I'd go easy this year <laughs> in my uh, first foray into green pine cones. So I went and I picked a bunch of green pine cones and cut them in half and kind of chopped them up a little and then soaked them in white vinegar. Uh, and then got rid of all the pine cones and just took that pine flavor, uh, nice and citrusy, and a little bit of that pine element is then infused into that vinegar. Uh, and we've been using that pine vinegar this year. It's really hmm. quite delicious. And what, what kind of a dish would you use that in? I, I've been making vinaigrettes out of it and putting okay. it on salads. Uh, anytime I want a little vinegar in my dish, I just throw a little Man, bit of that in there. It should be high in vitamin C, I would, oh, I would yeah. think. Yeah, and, you know, it's... Because I have heard, like, making tea out of, like, yeah. the long pines, you know, like white yep. pines or something like that. Yep. Just Apparently, uh, they the, used to use the uh, spruce tips. You know, the spruce tips come out in the spring, and you can go out and you pick all those. Uh, back when the settlers first got here, they didn't have hops, so they used spruce tips as the oh, hop wow. element in beer. Hmm. Uh, Is it cedar ba- or juniper berries? Which one? Juniper. Or both. Juniper berries. Yeah. That, okay. You can use that in certain things. I use juniper in everything. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, uh, juniper and sumac uh, are surprisingly sumac is interesting. usable. Again, lied to my whole life. Yeah. Like, thought, like... Poison. Yeah. yeah. Sumac is poison. There's one like variety of poison sumac in the world, and, and it's a white berry. It's a white berry. Yeah. It's not even, like, it's, it's not even what we have. <laughs> and it, it's not what we have. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And, again, I've, I've read that there is... Now that I've started getting you know, more and more into the foraging thing, I'm just learning stuff at, like, every turn. But, yeah, the, the sumac berries are... Super high in vitamin C, apparently. Yeah, well, it's all citric acid, uh, and that citric acid just sits on the outside of there. Uh, I understand we're uh, uh, doing a podcast and people can't see, but I'm going to show you a picture anyway. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, people have Google. You can tell them what to go look at. Okay, well, if you uh, go Google it, you'll find something very interesting because I like uh, sumac tea. Uh, okay. So you take those staghorn sumacs. Uh, and you soak them in water and then just add a little bit of sugar you're, to you're it. You're talking the flower. Are you taking it off of? No, you're just leaving it just yeah, on the branch, that, everything. That, okay. that whole red cone. Okay. Right? So that whole red cone that's on that staghorn sumac, take 10 or 12 of those and mix them with a gallon of water. Beat it up real good with your hands, mix it around, and then filter it. And you end up with this really pink, pink. uh tea and it tastes just like pink lemonade really and you put a little bit of sugar in there and sweeten it up and then the no, pitcher this little uh, bottle here is that a tincture of some sort or yeah a, it's a oh. bitters it's an orange okay. bitters uh so the uh the pitcher dale is looking at <laughs> uh is a sumac margarita uh and you take that uh, sumac tea and a little bit of tequila uh, a little bit of simple syrup and then some orange bitters and you've got one of the best cocktails you'll ever eat, drink in your entire life. I'll have to try that. Uh, but it's so simple. And uh, if you've got kids, uh, sumac tea is one of those great things because you can make it anywhere. Uh, you can do it with uh, the sumac everywhere in the state. It's everywhere. It literally you is know, everywhere. You can't drive down the highway and not see yeah. just giant piles of it everywhere. I've, I've taken a couple of them things off when I'm uh, out and about, and I'll give it to my chickens. They like mm-hmm. to eat it because uh, I once – Grouse will eat it at yeah. times of the year. Yeah, the thing and then if you take those uh, cones off there, the big staghorn sumacs, uh, dry that and just let it dry. And then uh, with some sort of uh, sieve, uh, a strainer of some sort, just rub it in your hands. The inside is the seed. The mm-hmm. outside is the actual stuff with the flavor. And it's more uh, seed than it is anything, yeah. really. And, and then you can shake it out and you get this red powder. And that red powder you can buy uh, at some of your spice stores, and it's just sumac. Hmm. Uh, you mix that red powder with thyme, salt, and sesame seeds. Uh, and you've got a Middle Eastern spice called za'atar. And then you mix that spice with your venison and make kebabs, and you'll be very happy you did that. <laughs> you'll be very happy you did that. <laughs> a very uh, Mediterranean flair to your venison. Yeah, and, and apparently they use hmm. sumac all throughout the... God, I'm going to do that, as it is prolific. In fact, yeah. I have it. I didn't, when I first moved to the place I'm at now, I've been there for like eight years, um, there wasn't any sumac, but since I've brought those berries to my chickens, yeah, they not oddly enough, I have right sumac off everywhere and now. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it takes over. Yeah. But it, it's 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 a very interesting thing because it's everywhere and it's easy. Yeah. Uh, and it take you 20 minutes to make a big old gallon of sumac tea. 
uh, and then you can do anything with it. I like to take the tea, mix it with a little bit of gin and some molasses bitters, and you end up with a very nice cocktail there. <laughs> uh, the kids just like it. Uh, Not the know, cocktail. No, <laughs> uh, just the sumac tea with a little bit of fresca. Uh, and you end up with a nice sparkly, sparkly little yeah, summer drink, kinda and thing. the kids love it. Yeah, and and it's fun well, because you, you start mixing that with like a kombucha, and you can oh, really yeah. you you got the you got the hippies hook now. Oh God, I'm all about it. <laughs> uh, but you I love know, kombucha actually. I do too. Uh, you get the kids. Uh, you know, I take me and my in laws. We go to a cabin every year, and you get all five kids outside, and you go pick something out of the wild, and you bring it home. And you do something like that, and they look at you like you're the magic man. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, like you just did something that nobody on the earth has ever done. Well, and like the <laughs> gateway drug for kids to eat, get them to eat wild greens is wood sorrel. Yeah, because it, you know, just it's yeah. got that they're like, this is a sour patch kid. Yeah, you know, like exactly. <laughs> they uh, love it. And my nephews year, are just like hunting my yard for wood sorrel. Once I showed that to uh, them last year, we went to the cabin. You know, I'm an early guy so i get up early and four of the five kids were up early and i was like come on we're going and we went out and we just walked the roadways and found all the black raspberries we could uh filled a gallon bag full of them came home and i made black raspberry jam that morning and then made pancakes there's still plenty of berries uh, out there right now when oh i yeah. found that um the, the hen of the woods there was some i had some little trail side snack of oh yeah. blackberries and they weren't they were pretty tart they weren't yeah. really sweet this time of year but uh, but yeah i mean we made jam one of the mornings and made pancakes and everybody ate fresh blackberry jam just I can't like wait that. to use this on some goose oh yeah goose any of your venison duck any of your red meats just sear it and pile it on it's tasty that's that's one thing i want to get into is uh like sauces yeah they can go to eat at a nice place we were just at spoon and stable last night the oh, food really? was amazing yeah uh it's not the first time i've been there but it's the, that place is they make some really good stuff no, i've never been there oh you should go mm. it's really good a little spendy yeah but it's worth it yeah um but what i've noticed at any place like that where you're getting you know really high quality food there's always a sauce incorporated that oh, yeah. just takes it to the next level and i need to start diving into sauces and my home cooking chutneys are a great way to start you know it's a it's an indian condiment they put it on everything you can make it out of anything i've got four varieties of chutney in the shelf right now uh we grew rhubarb this year so we did rhubarb chutney had apple chutney i got uh, well, what constitutes a chutney versus a so jam it's, it's a sweet and sour Okay. Uh, and spice. So when you try the plum jam, you're going to get the sweetness of the plums. Uh, there's going to be, uh, I believe, dried cranberries in that one. Uh, so you'll have the sweetness of the plums and the dried cranberries. But then there's vinegar, mustard, some curry powder, uh, and a few other things in there that give it a spice. But then it's got cider vinegar in it that gives you the sour. And it's like that whole combination of spices and flavors all together. Uh, so it won't be sweet like a jam. It's savory, uh, but it's still got some sweet elements to it. Hmm. Yeah, I got a <coughs> shit ton to learn about all that stuff. Do you have some books out? No. You don't have them no, 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 no. I have no never books. written a book. Do you want to write a book? I'm, I'm thinking about it. Thinking about yeah, it? Yeah, it's I, a lot of work. I'm not uh, a book writer either, but like I said, I had an idea for a book. I don't think I should give it away. Someone's going to steal yep. it. Yep. I'll keep that one. Probably me. Tight to me. Probably yeah. you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's going to be like a lazy man. How to, yeah. yep. <laughs> Actually, kind of want to do, ah, fuck it, I'll just say what I'm thinking. Um, I want to do like a book that has, you know, you do like a regular recipe, make some great dish mm -hmm. step by step with like, you know, you've acquired all the ingredients as, as best you can, you know, when you make this great dish. And then, or the other side is going to be the quick and easy version. Mm -hmm. So just as an example, you, we'll use the goose tacos. Like, yeah. Get your spices all together. You know, you grind them, make your own spices. You know, all as much DIY as as you can. And then there's the go get some taco seasoning from the grocery store. Mm -hmm. You know, this can be the the super quick and easy version. So yeah. like on a stroganoff, you do it where you you make it. You know, maybe you're not milking the cow for the cream. Maybe we won't go that extreme. But you're you know, you make the sauce from scratch. And then there's the dried powdered version or whatever you get a jar of the sauce yeah. you know like you have the start to finish culinary version and then the like the busy person's version yeah like side by side and just make a, a little kind of book that way i think would be 
interesting. Yeah, did you ever that read that article? Uh, there was like an that. article about the seventeen thousand dollar turkey sandwich. No. Uh, so this guy uh, wanted to make a turkey sandwich, uh, but he wanted to do everything himself. Oh God! Uh, and it ended up costing him like seventeen thousand dollars <laughs> uh, to, to grow the wheat. Uh, yeah, he, he grew the wheat, oh, ground God. the flour, uh, flew to the ocean uh, to dry the salt, uh, to cure the turkey that he had to, uh, you know, grow oh, himself. Wow. Uh, and every, I mean, every step yeah, of the you way, have to, he, you he, have to cut uh, some corners somewhere. <laughs> I think there was a, a meat eater episode not too long ago, uh, the podcast where. Somebody was making, they know somebody who makes, I think, uh, soaps. They yeah. render, uh, you know, venison soaps yep. or wild pig soaps or something. And they're like, you know what, there comes a point <laughs> where you just can't do everything. No, you can't, you just, but well, it's always good to try once. Time, you, know? you know, Graham always said try everything twice because the first time you probably screwed it up. <laughs> More than likely. <laughs> have you dabbled in soaps? I have not. My sister makes soap. Okay. Yeah. See, there you uh, go. See, as long yeah. as you have somebody, yeah, no, do you she, save her the tallow for? No. She, I, we've talked about it a couple of times, saving uh, deer fat and whatnot for it, but I haven't got around to it just yet. No? No. But, no, I, I, I enjoy that. and I I've, I've talked about cookbooks a couple of times, and one of the cookbooks we've thought about writing is, you know, just recipes that include as many wild ingredients as possible. Yeah, yeah. You know, so instead of just a venison and then everything that you store-bought, but do a venison with a raspberry sauce that you went out and you picked the raspberries and you did everything and in- incorporate as much wild into it. Because every now and again you run into that unicorn where you put together a dish where – very few ingredients in there mm. uh, are store bought or right. otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And and when you can get away with that, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's so it's satisfying. Yeah, yeah. The flavor is like second to the accomplishment. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, oh, I did. Look what I have done. Yes, uh, it is. I 100% agree with that. And once I start getting into the foraging of like wild greens and you realize like almost everything you pull out of your garden is perfectly edible as it is. Yeah. Does it taste as good? Eh, probably not, but it's what it lacks in, in flavor. It makes up for a nutrition. Yeah. You know, you're exactly. eating a, a piece of iceberg lettuce that has almost zero nutrition in it and a couple leaves of, you know, nettle. It's yeah. far more nutrition. And I'm not the healthiest eater in the world. I mean, I'm a lot better now than I used to be, but if I'm going to, I'm very literal. So it's like, if I'm going to eat healthy, I want to really eat healthy. So it's like, if I'm going to have a salad, I want a nettle salad. Yeah. Nettle, pigweed, lamb's quarter, plantain salad, yeah. you know, that I just picked out of my backyard versus some iceberg lettuce. Because at least now I feel like I'm actually getting something out of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And it tastes good. I mean, yeah. it, they really do taste well, good. And uh, now on the taste thing, I'll, I'll throw a caveat in there. Uh, the first time I ate nettles, I felt like I was eating dirt. Really? Yeah. Uh, and then after that, you become accustomed to it, and then the flavor changes. Well, it, does have a t- it definitely has a texture to it. Yep. It's a rougher texture. Uh, but, like, even with a, a lot of wild game, uh, the very first time you eat it, it's it's an adjustment because you haven't eaten it. Right, yeah. It's, uh, it's totally we're, we're all very different. used to the whole corn-fed mm-hmm. everything, and all the meats are very bland, and they taste very much like what we put on them, not like anything else why a lot of people don't like grass-fed beef yeah. tastes different, different than the beef, than beef the, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we've eaten enough of it at our house that nobody notices so when you eat venison all the time your taste buds change when you eat ducks all the time your right. taste buds change but somebody who's never eaten it before steps into that realm and they eat it and it's different it's different yeah. my sister can't eat lamb for oh, whatever reason what? yeah but we eat a lot of venison mm. so when you eat lamb it doesn't taste any different. You know, it just tastes like meat. Yeah, uh, I love lamb. Yeah, I do too. Love it's, it. It's I like my meat to have flavor. Yeah. I mean, that's why I just, I honestly don't crave beef anymore. No. Like, again, you put a ribeye in front of me, I'm going to eat it. Yeah. It tastes great. Uh, even a regular hamburger, sure, I'm going to eat it. I'm not going to turn stuff down. But as far as, like, you're sitting in the house watching TV and you get a hankering for something, it's never like, man, I just, 
really want a beefsteak. Yeah. Like this does not happen anymore. No. If I get that red meat craving, it's like, oh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go set out a yeah. venison steak. Yeah. There's bound to be elk in the freezer. Oh, so if that's I need to do that. Although if the way Joe Rogan talks about axis deer, I think I need to go yeah. get some of that. Apparently yep. that's the cream of the crop. Although I'll tell you, uh, my buddy's wife shot a moose last year. And they don't know what to do with 600 pounds of meat. I know so, what they can do with it. Yeah, they've been giving it to me. <laughs> Send it my uh, way. <laughs> so I've been eating a lot of moose in the last year uh, and showing them how to eat it. And they've been eating a lot of moose. But, I mean, 600 pounds of meat is a lot. That's meat. a lot. Yeah. That is a uh, lot. So, I mean, moose is phenomenal. Oh, well, I've, uh, I've had moose before. And, and, and I just, I, I've really enjoyed eating I've heard mooses. caribou is really good. I've not eaten caribou yet. I, I had, had caribou jerky, me, and once. again, you know how people exaggerate stories. But I've heard, you know, like elk is better than venison. Yeah. But and someone said, well, I would trade, you know, two elk for one caribou. Yeah. So it's yeah. apparently it's better, or somebody says it's I'm, better. I'm, I'm not knows? lucky enough to be able to. I bet it's all good. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm sure of it. <laughs> if it's wild, it's probably delicious. Yeah. Now, have you messed around with bear much? Uh, I've had bear. I've had. Um, so I never really got into bear hunting, and this will be a repeat story for some of my listeners, but I'd always heard it was gritty and yeah. greasy. Yeah. Um, so Stringy it didn't greasy. really sound great to me, and I wasn't one for, like, I really wanted a bearskin rug on my wall, mm-hmm. so I just never bear hunted. Yeah. Uh, I was working on um, at a resort, Astral Lodge on Cabotogama, and in the fall it turned into bear camp. The outfitter used the resort as their base camp. And so one of their clients shot a bear, and they cooked some up. He's like, oh, you should come try this. I'm like, oh, I'll try anything once, you know. And they just kind of was like shredded beef is what it kind of looked like. And mm-hmm. they had some barbecue sauce and whatever. I just reached in, grabbed a handful, threw it in my mouth, and, like, my eyes must have got the size of saucers because I yeah. just couldn't believe it. It was, I think, what some people called greasy. It was fatty, but in a good way. Mm-hmm. Like, it was juicy, flavorful. I was like, like instantly I'm like, so apparently I got to think about bear hunting <laughs> yeah I've, I've never bear hunted uh and i've only been fed bear uh and i enjoy it it's delicious but it is really good i really like to cook with it sometime i think there'd be a lot of a lot of things are in very there. fatty <clears throat> it's all right I no i mean i'm not saying that is a bad thing yeah. i think it could be a good thing you could if you really want to get industrious you could render some oh i absolutely bear yeah, fat down for some lard yeah. yeah and then yeah, that's so. something i haven't gotten into that i would like to um just because duck fat, like cooking with duck fat, mm-hmm. is like probably the best oil medium <laughs> that you oh, can yeah. cook with. Yeah. And for as many ducks as I shoot in a year, like, have you done? Have you rendered out duck oh, yeah. fat before? Yeah. What is it? Is what's that process? Okay, so um, it's a hard process because you have to make choices. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dang it! There, there's a lot of duck fat uh, underneath the skin on your breast, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to make a choice. Do you want to render that out or do you want to eat it? Right. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, but the rest of that carcass then uh, has fat in it. So if you roast that carcass like you're going to make mm-hmm. stock, the fat renders out automatically. So then you can sure. drain that fat off, filter it, and then you end up with your fat. How, you don't clarify it at all? You're yeah, just you just run it through cheesecloth. Oh, okay. Yeah, filter it a little bit. I mean, bit. you're not, like, putting it in water. Oh, and God, trying no. to, You're not doing that. Okay. No. So you're really just filtering uh, off the yeah, juices. Yeah, just, just the, the chunks out, out of it. Okay. You're, you're all good to go. And then, like, the geese we shot last year, uh, in the late November, were so fat that when you reached inside the cavity, you could pull out a handful of that fat. That big yellow yeah. ball of fat that's yeah. in the gut and cavity. And then with that, yeah, you take a little bit of water, maybe a tablespoon or two uh, in a pan, uh, low heat, and then you put all that fat in there and just render. Okay, and that's the way to do it. Yeah. Now you get to save the skin fat for the meat. Yeah. And then you just take that big ball of fat out, and then you jar that. Right. But there's still skin fat that you're not going to use. Uh, True. Because you, if you take the breasts off, you take the legs off, there's still skin on there, and there's still fat on there. Last year, uh, one of the geese we shot uh, had a natural foie gras on uh, you familiar with foie? Yeah, I okay. love foie. Uh, Just had it last night at uh, Spoon's yeah. Table. <laughs> and it's a, it's a natural process, and that's another thing that people don't understand. Migratory birds gorge themselves before they fly, and they store fat in their livers to burn during the migration. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're lucky enough to be in that migration mm-hmm. south, uh, yeah. you shoot one of these geese, I get a giant damn liver out of this. Uh, now, 
when I say giant, it was maybe twice the size of a normal liver, okay. which is still half the size of a foie that you buy right. from yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but phenomenal. You know, uh, nice and tender and delicious. All right, uh, so what do you, so, oh, God, I need to know how you're going to make the foie gras. Like wild goose so, foie gras. So um, I'm going I'm to maybe, <laughs> maybe upset people, uh, but uh, we pulled it out, uh, cut it in half, and ate half of it raw right really? there. Really? Yeah. Uh, and it just melts. It just melts. What's the flavor like? Uh, goose liver, but really mild goose liver. Did you uh, cool it down at all? You just ate no, it warm no, no, right no. out of the I break? pulled it right out. All right. It. I'm going to, I am so going to, yep. well, I'm not going to be able to shock anybody because I think my buddies usually listen to this, yep. but um, I'm so going to try that. Yeah, no, just take so a little bite of it. we go to North Dakota in the fall and we try to get snow geese. Yeah, it, and, and you'll see it because, uh, you know, a, a normal liver is like rich and red, mm-hmm. right? A foie will be almost yellowish. Really? Uh, yeah, uh, and it'll be light and so different. So that's the one you want to go yeah. for. And then just take a little piece of it. You can almost cut it with your finger. Because it will be so fatty and just so tender. Uh, just take a little bit and try it, and it will it'll melt on your tongue. Okay, so I have and I have three ducks at my house, domestic ducks of various breeds, and I also have two geese, domestic yeah. geese. Now, those should have, right, I mean, they're, they're free range. I mean, they're not, mm-hmm. you know, but, right, their livers should be. Their livers are totally edible. Uh, they are won't they be, be foie. foie? They're <laughs> not going to be foie. No. I would have to gorge You'd them. You'd have to gorge them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because they're not gorging themselves. No. I mean, they eat nonstop. Yeah. So, I mean. Uh, <laughs> and they're never not crazy. If, if you're ever going to butcher one uh, and you don't want to go full on cone in the mouth right. feeding yeah, the corn yeah, mash yeah, yeah, to yeah, them. Which I don't. Uh, separate one and then just put way too much food in there and let it just keep eating and eating and eating. Because they will. Uh, if you do it especially at the right time for that duck or goose, uh, they'll find that right time. Just keep feeding it and feeding it and feeding it. Uh, fatten them up. Yeah, fatten it up. I mean, they still have a ton of fat on them. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, this isn't the first time I've had ducks. It's the second time I've attempted geese. The mm-hmm. first time they ran away. So i got to make sure that doesn't happen again. They literally tried to migrate. Yeah. They can't even fly, but they've they wanted went to for go. a walk. Yeah. <laughs> so i got to make sure they can't do that this year. Yeah. Um, and we're getting close, so i got to work on that fence. Um, but the ducks, I mean, good Lord. I mean, those things... The fat never stops coming out of them. No. I mean, when you're cooking no, them, it's no, like no, yeah. I'm draining yeah. that pan left and right. You want to talk and, about and having goose fat. And if you're, if you're draining Lord. fat out of it as you cook it, uh, just put it in another container and then filter it through some cheesecloth. You'll taste it, and, you know, depending on what seasonings you used, it might be salty. Yeah, it's or probably going to be salty. But you can still use it. Right. You know? And so, like, how would you store that? Just Tupperware container in the freezer. freezer? Yeah. No, yep. I've got you're not you know, jarring it. You're not canning it. Or no, anything. I don't can. I, I I I can other things, but when it comes to meat proteins, I typically don't can. Uh, I just put it in the freezer, okay. and f- uh, that fat in the freezer will last forever. Um, uh, <laughs> I had an accident a couple of years ago because I keep uh, I keep a jug of it in the freezer, and then when I need it, I just take a little a knife scoops, and I, yeah. I cut some off. Well, I was in a hurry. And the the fat in this container was solid, and it was frozen. So I dug a knife into it, and I tried to pop it. And as I tried to pop a little piece out of it, the, the fat separated, and the knife went right through the container. Oh, no. And I, I cut my ring finger ah. almost off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to go in, and they've done Yikes. a remarkable job. But, I mean, I cut it from here. All the way around to oh, here. Right. He's, and, he's and talking like right at the base of his hand. Yeah. And, I mean, the oh. knife went right through, and it cut halfway Lord. through the bone. Uh, so oh. I almost cut my finger that off. That sounds terrible. Just getting a little bit of fat out of there. Oh, my God. So the, you do have to be careful. Um, but, uh, yeah, you just flake it off and put it into a pan and render it and melt uh, it again. I got to do And that. you can fry anything in it. You know, oh, fry, so like duck yeah. frites or, you know, which yeah. is fries in yeah. duck fat. That's perfect. Oh, so good. Yeah. They're so good. The other thing I think I need to do, like with fries, I've heard that double frying them is how you get them really crispy. That's what they tell me. Yeah. You haven't tried it? No. Okay. I need to no. try it this year. That whole, you know, heating your oil to 275 degrees and cooking them for five minutes and then pulling them out and draining them. Too then, much work. And then cooking <laughs> your, you know, uh, just make smaller fries. And there you go. Good you know. That. Do the shoestrings. I do like uh, shoestring yeah. fries for that very reason. You know, and then and then fry them in hot oil and they cook. 
and they're and, and they're they fresh. get nice and crispy. <laughs> there you go. See that you get the, the the lazy man version right there. Yeah, that's just perfect. Now, if you really want to blow your mind, oh yes, please. Okay, uh, a potato okay. is a very interesting creature. Francis, and not all potatoes are created right. equally. Uh, Francis Mallman, who is an Argentinian chef, has a potato that he calls potato dominoes. So you take a potato and you cut it into a rectangle, right? So you end up with like what looks like a, a weird stick of butter. Okay. And then about every quarter inch, just cut straight down until you get little squares. And now you've got that whole thing stacked together. And if you just push it back like dominoes, uh, it kind of lays back mm-hmm. on itself. And you've got this pretty little potato there. And you put some salt and pepper and butter on it and then roast them in an oven. And when you roast them in an oven, for whatever reason in this configuration, the outside gets a little crunchy. But the way it's laying on top of itself, it's sort of like the creamiest mashed potato you've ever had inside. So then when you Hmm. you serve it, you just take it, the whole thing, and you put it on a plate, a little piece of venison next to it, and then you cut into it. You've got like that crunchy outer French fry, but the whole inside is like a mashed potato. And the butter and the salt and the pepper then sort of help with it. But a roasted potato like that, it just... good. I think I had something similar. They didn't do the... At Spoon and Stable last night, but they were like these little tiny, I think they were yellow potatoes. And they must have deep fried them. I don't know if they boil them and then deep fried them because they're just like a normal potato with like, you know, soft inside, but the outside was crispy without yeah. any sort of batter on it. I mean, it had a light, they had to have deep fried them. Yeah. Like I'd never had one like that. They were phenomenal. Yeah. Super crispy on the outside and nice and soft. In the well, and inside. you know the little or baby outside, potatoes? I don't know I said that. Uh, you yep. get the little bags mm-hmm. in there. That's what these were. Yeah, about a golf ball size. Take those and boil them uh, and then let them cool. And once they're cool, just give them a little press to smash. break them and smash them. I, I do those. And then deep fry them. Oh, I don't deep fry them. I'll yeah. bake them. Oh, yeah. No, With no. a little bit of, like, uh, Parmesan cheese yeah. on top. Yeah, and then deep fry them. <sighs> so yeah, good. it is. I it's haven't deep fried them. I'll have to try that. Yeah. That would be really good it, too. Well, it, you know, baking and deep frying – Either way, but the deep frying just adds that little. Right, that little it, the whole thing is crunchy and it's soft in the middle. Fry them in duck fat. You could. <laughs> yep. That might be too good. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> Who's our waitress? I want to get another beer because I want to talk to you about the BHA stuff. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that's a conversation that's going to yeah. require another beer. Perhaps. What I found when I do these in a bar or restaurant, they're very polite and leaving us alone. Yeah. But the downside of that politeness is. I have an empty beer sitting next to me. Yeah. It's not okay. Um, well, the flag went down. I'm maybe she gets close. Maybe we should press pause for a moment. Uh, and then uh, that would give me an opportunity to uh, go to the bathroom. Oh, we can do that. I'll and, do that. And, and then uh, maybe find our waitress, get another beer, and start part two. Let's do that. All righty. On our break there, we were talking about squirrel hunting. Um, getting out. and You can find squirrel woods. Not too far, generally, Everywhere. where you're at. Yeah. yeah, and, you know, it's another interesting thing because when you tell people that you like on squirrels, they're like, why? It can't be sporting. They, they just sit right there. Go out into the woods and try to shoot a squirrel. I'll tell you, it seems <laughs> sometimes it's like that. It's like, I don't know if it's, you know, they know they're being hunted, that kind of thing, but there's so many times that I've gone, like, bow hunting, and I'll be walking to my stand, and you basically walk up on a squirrel. Yeah. And you, you scare the shit out of him. He's like, oh, crap, there's a person there. Yeah. But if you go into the woods... <laughs> with the intent on shooting a squirrel, they seem to be like the most elusive creature yeah. on the planet. Now, I don't know that it's legal, and I've been meaning to check into the legality of it because I think I have an idea as far as squirrel hunting goes. Okay. Uh, I went out, uh, oh, two years ago. I was sitting in a deer stand, and where my deer stand is, there's a farm, and there's animals, and it's not all that uncommon to have a dog run through the woods and when dogs run through the woods nothing really happens right but i was sitting up in the stand and i heard something i was like oh it sounded small maybe there's something walking through and i turned and there was a cat a small farm cat and as that small farm cat worked its way through the woods every squirrel in that area stood out on a branch and barked and I don't know if it's just because a cat can climb a tree and they know they that. They were given the alarm call. But they were given the alarm call. So what I want to do is I want to get somebody's cat and put it on a leash and bring it out into the woods <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and start I a whole new variety I of, of hunting. I, I don't think those laws have been drafted. 
quite yet. Um, you know, uh, I've read those hunting those uh, like, law books from front to back, and I don't recall anything about uh, a hunting cat. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I think I, you're good. Yeah, I, I I would like to know if that is a problem because I I, I, I definitely why you can I, have a hunt you can have a squirrel dog. Yeah, why would a squirrel cat be different? <laughs> be, <laughs> because when you say squirrel cat, it makes me want to laugh. I, well. It's hilarious. A squirrel cat. I, I could well, start breeding a specific line a, of squirrel cats. Dude, you're, you're stumbling on a whole market here that you're just giving away for free. You could be, you could be training uh, AKC squirrel cats. Well, I tell you what. If any of Dale's listeners out there want to take a cat out into the woods and get back to me, let me know. Because it only it happened the once. It would be an interesting uh, experiment just yeah. to see if it's repeatable. Yeah. If it was just a thing or... It just seemed really strange that this cat just sort of slunk through the woods and there were dozens of squirrels that just came out and they were barking and barking and it was loud and i was like god it has to be that cat i bet it is and they just must be scared to death of this cat and maybe it was just that one area yeah and this one cat that I terrorized all these it. squirrels but <laughs> I, I bet they do the same thing when a bobcat slinking through the woods probably yeah he might be onto something well you know get some squirrel cats <laughs> Squirrel cats. Squirrel cats. Yeah. The next the next article for outdoor life. Absolutely. There Hashtag squirrel cat. Hashtag squirrel cat. <laughs> oh man, my creative brain is running amok right now. I'm gonna have to There's a t shirt in there yeah, somewhere. There's something there's there's definitely something there. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna work on that. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier you're uh you're a BHA guy, but you yeah. actually hold a position here in Minnesota. Yeah, so uh, in the state of Minnesota, uh, I'm one of the board members. Uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, for those that don't know, is an organization that started out west. It's a conservation organization, uh, not unlike Ducks Unlimited or Pheasants Forever. But instead of focusing on a species, we're focused on land. And the land that we're interested in protecting is the 647 million acres of public land that we all have access to. In Minnesota, that breaks down to our uh, national forests, our wildlife managing areas, and the boundary waters. Uh, And there's all sorts of other little lands in there as well that fall under that. Uh, We want to make sure all those lands stay open so that whether you are a hunter or an angler or whether you do other things, uh the outdoor rec industry is a huge industry uh hikers bikers kayakers campers uh the off-road vehicle crowd all those guys everybody's out there using public lands and we need to make sure they stay accessible to all of us forever right yeah and it's there's a weird i don't know some weird thing um kind of an unseen thing that happened with like wildlife management areas because you have some of these smaller ones mm-hmm. that some developments will start springing up around these wildlife management yeah. areas. And so these wildlife management areas where you used to be able to go in and hunt, suddenly now you can't hunt because they're surrounded by houses. Yeah. And while that land is public, you've lost at least the hunting aspect of it yeah. is gone. Yeah. And, um, and and that's problematic. Uh, the other thing that's problematic is here in the state of Minnesota, there's sort of this uh, unwritten policy uh, known as no net gain. And it's come up in a couple of counties where uh, it, lands that are put into public access uh, are then substituted by taking other public lands out of public access. So in Fillmore County, there was an issue where a farmer uh, had passed away and wanted to leave his farm to the Minnesota DNR. Uh, and it was blocked uh, because the city council or the county commission, I should say, uh, didn't want to lose 400 acres uh, of tax revenue. Of tax revenue. Uh, and then that went sort of off the rails because uh, the person that wanted to buy it was a relative of one of the county commissioners. Oh, and, Jesus. Uh, that gets... The waters get muddied up pretty uh, yeah, quick. Yeah, it gets squirrely in a heartbeat. Uh, and then up in Lacaparle Lac- County, there was a similar issue, uh, and they wanted to put 200 and some odd acres into public land but in order to do that they wanted to sell off 200 acres because they wanted to keep everything balanced and those little nuanced issues are it's it's hard because you kind of understand it but at the same time it's not like we're taking half of minnesota and saying we want it all back right uh 
Minnesota in the in the realm of public lands is sitting pretty good. Uh, I think we're 16th uh, in the states. Uh, I think 23, 24 percent. Quite a bit of public land. Yeah, 23, 24 percent of the state is open to public access uh, for different uses, and it doesn't all have to be one use. Uh, you know, out west, uh, some of that land is set aside for the Bureau of Land Management. That lands, those lands were set aside for revenue, and some of that revenue is uh, timber, uh, mineral. Uh, oil, uh, and that's what it's designed for, but it's also not designed to be stripped and you know pillaged. Uh, it needs to be done responsibly in a way that yeah, sustainable uh, lets the land heal afterwards and move on. And that's what we're dealing with here in Minnesota with a possible mine on the edge of the boundary yeah, waters. Yeah, that one's not a good one. Like well, I, I find it, I find it's an interesting um, politically. I find it interesting because. Uh, not to pick on any particular party, but the the DFL generally, stereotypically, you know, they'll be for. I mean, those are those are DFL holdout counties yeah. in northern Minnesota. Generally. Used to be blue collar miners, you know, um, lumberjacks, you know, the, uh, that those kind of industries. So I, I find it interesting to see these uh, Democratic candidates or office holders now kind of struggling. Which way, to, you know, are you taking? Are you for the little man? Are you for the blue collar worker that needs a job, or are you for the environment? And it's like they have to kind of toe this line because right. both things <clears throat> generally, stereotypically, fall under the banner of the DFL. And so this mine that they're proposing in the Boundary Waters, it's like, what do you do there? You know, what, which which ones of your constituents yeah. are you supporting? So as BHA, uh, I don't know that we have an official statement on it. I think the line we've been going with is we are not anti-mining. Mining done in a fashion that it's supposed to be done is is what it's supposed to be. Uh, there are many mines up north that are still operating, and all that is supportable. Uh, this one particular mine in this one particular place just doesn't seem like a good idea. This yeah, type of seems, mining has never like not polluted. The margin of error, error yeah. is is razor thin and just like you just said i've read the articles that say this type of mining has yep. never not polluted water right. before and in the area that it's at the kuishui river runs north through the boundary waters so well, it's just gonna pollute canada yeah oh fuck it let's build it <laughs> well <laughs> in, in, or, in order to pollute canada it has to pollute minnesota first ah, uh, can we build it further north no ah, unfortunately not uh, but no, it is. It's, so it's, what we do is we sell the land to Canada, no, north of there. It's one point one million it. acres. No, it's, <laughs> it's that's mine. Uh, it's yours too. Uh, but uh, it's it's just one of those issues that, uh, unfortunately, in today's society, there's just not enough nuance. Uh, no, you're, you're either for, or you're nuance. against, and if you're if you're for it, you're an idiot. If you're against it, you're, you're an, an animal. Uh, and everything's wrong. Everybody's and a snowflake, too, yes. by the way. Well, just, you know, that's what I've been told. Uh, every ar- every political argument now is who can call who a snowflake first. Yes. That's basically uh, what it boils down to. And I, it's just this particular area should not be uh, at risk. And it needs to be permanently protected, and it hasn't been yet. Uh, there's so many smaller issues in that. Yeah, I think we share a pretty similar opinion on that i i'm generally not you know across the board anti-mine either but this like i said this one particular yeah. one the alarms start going off right. in my head and it's like well, i it, don't know about this one not to i know people like to throw a lot of things out there but you know the outdoor rec industry uh when looked at uh two years ago i was in boise idaho for backcountry hunters and anglers national rendezvous uh, and there was a gentleman that gave a little speech named Yvonne Chenard. Uh, Yvonne Chenard is the owner and CEO of Patagonia. Uh, he had some very interesting numbers. Uh, the outdoor rec industry, when combined together, hunting, fishing, hiking, backing, kayaking, mountain biking, all these people, when combined together, are $887 billion worth of business a year. So much money. Yeah, that's higher than oil. Wow. So That's <laughs> and wow. Th- that makes up a larger portion of the U.S. Uh, gross domestic product than oil. 
And when you look at that. Well, that needs to be on billboards everywhere. It does. It does. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there's this myth that uh, backpackers and hunters can't get along. Well, it's definitely definitely a myth. Um, but if I can throw in a little bit of controversy, it would be yeah. nice if, like, campers, backpackers, mountain bikers had some sort of Pittman license Robertson or yeah or Pittman Robertson yep. Act which some sort of familiar, excise tax or, on yeah on your goods can go into it because right now that's falling on and oh this is I love that you brought up the that act because a lot of people are for it when they when they hear the hunting you know all the mm -hmm. sales from hunting equipment oh they're so great you know what the also falls into that category is is money set aside for like shooting ranges yes. and those evil guns. Like some people, because you can grab a lot of backpackers, you start bleeding into a different political mindset mm -hmm. when you get into hiking and camping and backpacking that might not be very gun friendly. Right. Uh, but that same act, so those sales of ammunition, guns, scopes, that's going into your hiking and your camping. So you're kind of, if, if you're trying to, if you're a heavy advocate for heavy regulation of firearms, mm -hmm. to trying to find a nice way of saying that, you're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater because who's going to pick up that tab? Right. Because your tent isn't taxed on that. Right. Your headlamp isn't Not taxed yet. on that. Not yet. Not yet. But that's what we're getting as I, I think it should. I do too. And Yvonne Chenard even said, you know, even if the outdoor rec industry, the backpacking crowd – even if they did a 1% excise tax. Because currently, I believe, guns are 10 or 11%. Yeah, uh, it's not small. And no, it's not. And fishing, uh, Dingle Johnson is another one. So the hunting crowd and the fishing crowd are funding most of it. You want to know what makes uh, me giggle more than, than Dingle Johnson? Cat? Dingle Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> he had proposed even a 1%. A 1% tax on $887 billion a year is $88 billion. Yeah, that's a lot. And that's a lot of money that yeah. could go back into the outdoors. Yeah. And who who would be against that? Well, uh... Like, when, when this is brought up, who who's fighting it? Who, who's the voices against? I, I'm not going to call anyone out specifically. Uh, it's not outdoors. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, totally turning that up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but there are people that, you know, they, they see a, a tax on their equipment and uh, gear as a way that would deter people from buying. But a 1% on $100 is costing you $101? Yeah, but there there are those out there that the bottom line is making more money. It's true. I mean, I, I do I, I do know that that mentality exists. And, and Dingle Johnson and Pittman Robertson uh, were put forward by hunters and fishermen. Right. And I was, I was going to bring up that very point. It's like, this is a voluntary thing. This yeah. wasn't of some politician came right. like, hey, we're going to do this. No, this was like the people using the, the resource realized that they wanted the resource they wanted to last. It forever. Yeah. Um, they proposed it. And it's not often that the civilians go up to yeah. legislatures, legislators and go, take some of my money. Like, that doesn't usually happen. We usually vote the other way. <laughs> uh, but I find it pretty interesting that some of these people might be against such a tax but could be, you know, for raising a gas tax, if you will, you know, or well, anything that goes into the general fund. Because I'm sorry, when something goes into the general fund, that money is lost. I, I honestly don't know that they're against it. I, I don't know that they know well, it. Well, who's the lobby? Who, so yeah. it's it's the you know because when you when you look at the outdoor rec people, you know your mountain climbers. I don't know that they're aware that you know the you know ten dollar park pass that they pay for isn't enough, right? Uh, and that everything else could be helpful. Uh, I don't know that the mountain bikers. I mean, I think. And maybe it's just because I'm used to paying it. It's like it's, it's something you don't see. It's like no. I have this thing with my credit union. Uh, it rolls my change. It rounds up and it rolls yeah. my change into my savings account. It's just money you forget about. Next right. thing you know, you look at your savings account like, oh, I'm more than I thought I did. Yeah. No, I, That's I what do that the same taxes, thing. That's taxes. Round you know, numbers. It's, it's why, you know, you're doing that 1%. Again, it's $100. Now it's $101. Right. Okay, whatever. You just, you don't, I don't think that's going to deter anybody from buying anything. No. So those in the 
bottom dollar mindset, if you're worried about reduced sales, I, I don't think that's a legitimate concern. These people that are passionate, look what they're look at the money they spend. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Fifteen hundred dollar <throat> bikes. Yeah. Six hundred dollar backpacks. Yes. Shoes specifically designed for this and for that, for this kind of rock and that kind of rock. Mm-hmm. Those are two hundred and fifty dollars, three hundred and fifty dollars. But they're not afraid to spend money. No. So instead of three hundred and fifty dollars, it's three hundred now I gotta think of math. Three hundred and fifty, three hundred and fifty. Three hundred and eighty five. Whatever. <laughs> Doesn't whatever. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> bad at math, bad at names. Yep. Whatever. But um, no, it is. It's a it's they're a, not gonna care. It's a a thing that needs movement and it needs progress, but it also needs attention. So what we need is for people just to understand that what's out there and what is available to you, uh, to all of us. Hell, you got uh, people that use those fat tire bikes for bow hunting. Yeah. That's a new movement that's been yeah. picking up speed, no pun intended. But those people also need to understand that there are areas that they probably shouldn't be in. Uh of, of those 647 million acres of public land that we get to go use, a very small percentage of those is set aside for wilderness area. And those wilderness areas have a different designation. Mm-hmm. Fat bikes shouldn't be allowed there. Right. We should all be okay with that. I would think so. But there are fat bikers well, out yeah. there that are... Well, people are selfish. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, I mean, people as a whole, you yep. know, <clears throat> are selfish to their individual But I think interests. that's... You know, like the four, the guys that like to go bogging, right? Yeah. Hey, I paid my taxes, pay for this too. True, but if what you do shits on somebody else, yeah. then you cross that line now. Like if you're, but if maybe you're there should up be a an area slew, that they should get to go yeah, to, and and we should have that area. In and I think that. that's where the the opposition has done a wonderful job in pitting us against each other. Yeah. Uh, well, we do it. We do it with ourselves. Yeah. I mean, you just know. down to the microcosm of walleye guys versus bass guys. I yeah. Mean, it just. Traditional archers every versus other, compound yeah, archers. Every other, every uh, other angler on the lake's an idiot. Yeah, versus. I mean, look at that guy back in that boat, and what a moron! I uh, mean, you, you hear all the time. Is the crossbows. Yeah, crossbows yeah. are a problem, uh, and I mean, we all need to understand that these issues aren't black and white. They're they're very very nuanced. Very and we nuanced. need to understand yep. that. Yep, and and we're stronger together than we are apart. Uh, so we're the strongest thing in the world if we're all together. Yeah, we like just said, need to figure we get more than the oil industry. <laughs> we just so. need to figure out how to come together. God damn it! You just put a Beatles song in my mind. I don't even like the Beatles. Yeah, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're so similar. Well, it sucks because I do enjoy Beatles songs when sung by other people. Uh, well, so if we're gonna go off on that tangent, which this podcast is famous for. Um, I feel like it, like the Beatles were a beneficiary of just zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. Like the, it was uh, today, if you brought Yellow Submarine into the office yeah. of your record label, they'd slam the door so hard on you. But like, they got away it's with a it. terrible song. They got away with it because she loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got away with it because they had gotten so big that they literally couldn't fail could record Yellow Submarine yep. and it would be a number one. Or That's I am how the big walrus. they got. Cuckoo Cachoo. Cuckoo Cachoo. The other one, the, you know the song that I absolutely, like, I hate and it's not, the song itself is actually pretty good, at least melodically, is is Come Together. Mm-hmm. But it's catchy as hell. Like, it's great. Yeah. But the words are nonsensical. Walrus Gumboot, Toe Jam Football, what the fuck are you talking about? No. Are you playing? Did you spill a Scrabble or a Boggle game? You want to go down a very interesting internet rabbit hole? (laughs) Uh, Google Paul McCartney died in 1969. What the hell? Yeah, there's a big theory out there, conspiracy theory, that Paul McCartney died in a car crash back in the 60s, and they replaced him and never told anybody. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I am going to have to go down that rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. I mean... It's quite entertaining. <laughs> well, who recorded that song with Michael Jackson then? Uh, it wasn't Paul McCartney. Well, it was the he's, replacement. He's Paul McCartney now. <laughs> <laughs> he's been doing What's it. What's their for, evidence? He's been doing it for a while. They don't need evidence. Oh yeah, you don't need evidence for uh, a good conspiracy. The Earth is flat. Yeah. <laughs> Duh. What, what did I just see? It was posted as a meme, but it was like an excerpt of a conversation, like mm-hmm. a forum conversation or something, and it was something to the. The two, I'm going to paraphrase, but it's like flat 
earthers around the globe are coming together. And then the comment was, read that line again slower. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they are there. They're uniting insane. around the world. They are. In, really? Uh, yeah. Around the globe, it said. No, around the yep. globe. They oh, are God. insane. It's hilarious. And the fact that there's even a little bit of traction behind it. I can't believe it. that that came. When that came, when that, when I, the first time I heard that, I was like, oh, this is just a joke. You know, people are just having fun. And then it somehow grew legs. And I think yep. it's just this, the gregarious nature of human beings to be part of something. Yeah. To be part of a movement. And they I found knew their before niche. everyone else. Yeah, they found yeah. their little thing, like, I'm going to be a part of this. Yeah. And once that becomes your identity, you are going to argue it tooth and nail. Yeah. Just, I like the chili politics. peppers before under the bridge. Yeah. You know? You yeah, sure you did. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, right. Whatever. Yeah, it's like people just have to belong to a group. And that's, to bring it back in now, to get out of our rabbit hole, it brings us back into bringing all of the outdoor hobbyists together. Like, you yeah. have to acknowledge that that is an element of human nature, and we need to work past it because just because you're a mountain biker and that's your identity doesn't mean that you can't get along with that bow hunter or that rifle hunter yeah. when that's their identity and realizing that this same chunk of land – is important for all of us, even yeah. if we use it differently, because as a developer comes in, we all lose. Yep. And and it's the land is the important part, and we need to be able to step back and say, hey, uh, maybe my recreation needs right here aren't necessary. You know, maybe I don't need uh, a quad track here where I can go everywhere and do everything mm-hmm. and tear it up. Maybe... You know, the 4,000 miles of trails that are out there already are enough. And and to flip that coin over, the hunters that might have used an area that is going to be set aside for quad trails mm-hmm. that's going to get ripped up a little bit, you're like, well, I've always hunted there. you got to make some concessions. Yeah. You know, there's a give and take, and, yep. it, and we have to understand that. It's like if you want the quad guys to play nice with the hunters, mm-hmm. you're going to have to – give up something yeah otherwise it's not going to work if you both dig your heels in right nothing's going to get done and next thing you know there's houses popping up because you guys are too busy bitching at each other yeah i was just talking i had a buddy over this morning for coffee and we were talking about it where you know uh, there are a lot of people out there that want to hunt and they want to get outdoors but they don't know how Uh, and our wildlife management area system here in the state of minnesota gives us all access to little chunks of land here and there and some of them aren't very big no uh, pretty small but when you go to them and there's somebody else there you're like well i can hunt here too and they are here and i don't care and all this other stuff and i had mentioned that uh last year i got shot at uh and it wasn't intentional right and it wasn't anybody's fault if anything it was my fault uh i had gone in bow hunting i got there way early in the morning went out and found this nice little area where a couple of trees had fallen down and i got down in between these trees and i'm camoed from head to toe and some guy walked in and he was going to be doing some squirrel hunting and he took a shot at Didn't a squirrel you were there. He had no, whose fault is that yeah right. that ain't his fault uh yeah. you know he didn't he couldn't possibly have known i was right. there other than the fact that my car was at the entrance yeah but but you could have been anywhere yeah we're on 280 acres of land i could have been anywhere (laughs) did you see him uh not until i heard the bullet okay (laughs) yeah i I mean you could go (laughs) yep no Uh, and he was a ways off so the bullet that came by you know when you hear him zing by yeah (laughs) oh geez hi guy (laughs) you know doing this number Uh, (laughs) and you know uh, as the pee trickles down your leg yeah unfortunately you know when when i stood up and i kind of waved at him i think it scared him uh, and he beat feet for his car, and he headed out. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, it wasn't his fault. Right. Uh, it wasn't really – it was more my fault than it was his fault. Uh, well, and it wasn't any faults to be had there. That's yeah. just one of those It's c- an scenarios. unfortunate circumstance yeah, 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 yeah. is really all it was. Uh, and he didn't need to leave, you know, mm-hmm. and he wanted to go over to the other section. Now that he knew where I was, he could have gone okay, to the other push side. Gear to you. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, I don't really care. Uh, I was just having a good old time sitting out in the woods and having fun. 
uh, watching a raccoon up in a tree just go back and forth and trying to decide if it could come down. Doing and then a it raccoon would, thing. Oh, it would stop and it would look. <laughs> and I, I, like it knew something was not right. You have those, like when you're sitting there still and you like you catch movement and you look down and it's like a squirrel yeah. coming across. And it's like he know, you're so still and he's like he knows something's not right with this tree but he can't quite figure it out. And he just like, I mean, I've had him like eyeball to eyeball with like eight to ten inches away yeah. and they're like, and you I see, they see their head kind of like, they're like, something's so weird with this tree. But One of the stories <laughs> I love to tell people, and one of the reasons I love just hunting, uh, about six years ago, uh, I was in a tree stand, and I was falling asleep, you know, doing the hunter nod. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it had been a long day. It was cold as hell, and I was sitting there, and it was starting to get dark, and I was just going to wait until it was a little darker, and then I was going to climb down. And as I was sitting there, uh, I heard, like, this scratch next to me. And I was like, well, God, what was that? And and I didn't hear it again. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and I, I was wide awake at this point. <laughs> uh, and and I, I, I kind of turned to my right, and within arm's reach from me on the tree branch that came off to my right was an owl. Oh, and and it just it landed in the tree next to me, and it was just sort of staring at me like, I don't know what you are, <laughs> and I'm and and I just kind of looked at it and it just sat there, and like there was this great moment where there was an owl, you know, thirty six inches away from me, and I was just having the time of my life staring Watch at this that thing. Out. That would be so cool. I haven't had that happen, but I have seen them fly. They're so weird how they have that silent flight. Yeah, it's so bizarre. Like it it freaked me out but kind of in a good way i was bow hunting in the stand and i saw i saw the the owl flying through the woods and as i watched it from right from my right to left didn't hear a thing and it's like my mind was like does not compute does not and so yeah. that was kind of a really eerie like my brain was kind of sounding some alarms like something's not right you should have you should hear something yeah but i mean it's it's the <clears throat> most bizarre thing how they can have that silent flight yeah, like that it's it's unnerving <sighs> yeah but cool i oh, mean it's very. not like i'm afraid of it but it's no. like you're it, it like my brain didn't know what to do with that with the visual input without the audio yeah behind it it was like something isn't right here yeah. <laughs> even though i could rationalize it and go oh yeah i knew that owls were silent flyers but until you experience it it's no, like you don't have a compartment in your brain yeah. ready for that yeah, no, it's very different. They're uh, cool creatures, man. You know, one of the great things that I've sort of discovered with uh, backcountry hunters and anglers is just we, we've we got these get-togethers that we've done. Three weeks ago, we did the state rendezvous uh, over in Wadena, uh, and there was a park up there that we took over, and everybody came, and big outdoor camping weekend, and just to hang out, and some people came in and taught some classes on different things. Uh, we did a cooking contest. Uh, and along with the cooking contest, you know, we, we kind of asked everybody, if you're going to cook something, have a story behind it. Uh, and then you get to hear these stories about the outdoors from other people. And the guy who took second place uh, made a absolutely wonderful uh, traditional Minnesota tater tot hot dish Ooh. Uh, with bear meat. Uh, and... What set his hot dish aside from all the others, because truthfully, uh, I'm going to upset everyone. I hate tater tot <gasps> hot dish. Yeah. Uh, it's, How dare you, it's, sir? It's the most pointless dish on I earth. I love it. I know. Some people do. Some people don't. Uh, actually, some people do. Some people I don't. do. Monsters uh, don't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but it's, it's, I can't say it's ever, like, bad. You know, it's just, it's a nondescript it's dish wonderfully to me. bland. Yeah, exactly. It's just not, it's not <laughs> something that I rave about or that I, I, when I think about it, it's not something that I would, I would be like, oh man. You I could just, elevate it though. Yeah. Some of those mushrooms right there. Well, and so this guy kind of did. He took a blueberry compote uh, along with his tater tot hot dish and then served it with a okay. little blueberry compote over the top. But his story was phenomenal. Uh, he had gotten a bear tag for the Boundary Waters. And he went in and he set up camp and he went out bear hunting. And he said he canoed out and he went to this area and he was walking around doing everything. Hunted the whole day, nothing. 
and then he went back to his camp. And when he got back to camp, everything he had was torn apart. Uh, oh, God. Yeah, the, <laughs> the tent, all his food, everything was just ripped to shreds. Oh, no. So he was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So then he was like, well, my hunt is over. I got to pack everything up. Uh, and as he was looking around, he found one food pouch that was still intact. So he boiled some water, and he was going to make himself a little whatever, mountain house or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he was going to eat dinner, uh, and then he was going to get everything together and leave. Well, as he was sitting there waiting, he looks up, and 10 feet away from him is a bear. Oh, Jesus. Just staring at him. Uh, hey, you going <laughs> to eat that? <laughs> so, so he's sitting there, and this bear is right in front of him, so he shoots it. Well, yeah. Yeah, uh, and that's what he served us, was this that's bear that excellent. he shot. Yeah, and then, of course, his bear hunt was over, and he could go home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's amazing, dude. That's cool. When do these cook up? I need to enter one of these things. Yeah, I'll absolutely. get my ass handed to me, but it'll yeah, be really I interesting. I don't know. Uh, the guy who won this year did a really good job with I mean, that. if all I have to do is do, you know, green bean casserole, I'm, well, I'm in. He got second place. <laughs> uh, and, did you and, win? And no, I didn't oh. enter. I was one of the judges. No. Uh, so his uh, his green bean casserole was tasty, and the blueberry compote was really good. Uh, his story is what elevated him into second place. Gotcha. Uh, be a good story But teller. the guy who yeah. won uh, told us a great story about all the ingredients he had gathered. Uh, and he made a, a four-mushroom soup with all these more mushrooms that he had foraged and then served that with smoked pheasant, smoked duck, uh, and then some beer. Beer always wins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Noted. <laughs> but it was, it was, it was, uh, the soup was wonderful. It was like a, it was like a cream of mushroom soup with blue cheese. Ooh, uh, that and, would and be really not good. Not like a, not like a pungent, potent, punchy in the face blue cheese. But a cream of mushroom soup that just had enough blue cheese in it that it kind of tinged a little. That and sounds it really was good. Phenomenal. Oh man, I'm have to a lot of good dishes. Uh, another kid made a, uh, a snow goose curry that was phenomenal. Uh, we had a uh, champagne cream sauce with uh, so what pheasant. I, so now like my competitive nature is yeah. kicking in right now. So where my brain is at is like, all right, so I'm not gonna pre-plan any meal but as i'm out doing my stuff Mm -hmm. the story that jumps out at me whatever quarry yeah is around that story then i'm gonna have to like all right there's your dish yeah mark that one special yeah (laughs) when you put it in the freezer are you a bha (laughs) member uh i don't know that's a no well (laughs) but i think if anything is expired because i know i was at one point in time but i haven't Okay. I probably was at one point in time because I have some magazines and stuff at home. So I know yeah. I did sign up at one point in time. Okay. Probably bought a year membership and and it lapsed. Yeah. Because I'm well, no longer getting any it's a, publications. So I don't know. In in my opinion, it's it's the forefront of what conservation organizations should be, and it's pretty obvious because all the other groups are starting to follow our model. It's definitely something that I. <clears throat> that I should be a part of, that I want to be a part of, and I'll just be brutally honest, it's just pure laziness on, yeah. or, or um, uh, absent-mindedness is the only reason. Because anytime I'm, you know, obviously Ranella talks highly of yep. it on his podcast, and, and every time I'm listening to him, I'm like, oh, I need to I need to join that or, yeah. you know, re-up my membership or whatever, and then you get into real life and you just forget. It's, well, just, it's just really absent-mindedness. And it is, in, in my opinion, of the organizations that I've belonged to over my lifetime, uh, I was a Ducks Unlimited guy for a while. They turned me off. A couple of issues they had just set me wrong. Pheasants Forever has always been sort of consistent. Uh, it's not flashy. It's not grand. Uh, but it's always there, and it's consistent. Uh, RMEF, I'm a Minnesotan. I, I put my money into sure. RMEF just because. But it doesn't really do me much good here right now. Delta. Uh, you know, Delta is a good one. Minnesota Waterfowlers Association just folded. Just shut their uh, doors, So <clears throat> that's frustrating and upsetting because we're losing conservation organizations. But BHA, there's just this, this oddity in there where you can sit down at any of these events and have a long conversation with a complete stranger. Right. You know, uh, I did this archery shoot for them last weekend. 
Uh, I belong to an archery club down in Lakeville. I uh, thought it would be a good fit to do a BHA event with them. We did it. Uh, three weeks ago, I met a guy at the rendezvous up in Wadena, a guy named Chaz uh, Puntino, uh, Puntillo. Uh, and good guy, uh, hunter, uh, has only ever hunted private land in his entire life. Family farm, the whole nine yards over in Wisconsin. Good guy, great guy. Uh, met him, instantly enjoyed talking to him. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, he volunteers to come work at this thing. He and I go, uh, I'm there all weekend. He shows up, he's working. Uh, we're working it together. Uh, he happens to be a member of that archery club. Uh, hadn't been very active. Comes out to the meeting, talks to some people, uh, and is talking to the club president of the archery club. Uh, and the club president just says, you know, it was just such a weird vibe. Because I felt very included. And I, I don't always feel included, even though uh, right, yeah. it's, it's the archery club. Uh, but when all the BHA guys are around, I felt very included. And he made a comment that, you know, uh, Chaz and I and Matt, who was the other guy working out there, uh, seemed to have this really close-knit bond. And Chaz is like, I just met these guys three weeks ago. <laughs> I, I, prior to that, I've never known them. You know, it's <laughs> kind of that what's in a name. I think um, maybe it's intentional, maybe it's just a, a good side product of, but backcountry hunters and anglers, just because you have those two yeah. uh, different identities, if you will, in the title, it kind of lets people know this isn't a – one thing organization. Well, this isn't a Ducks Unlimited. This isn't said, a national. It's, it's a tur- little Wild Turkey Federation. A this little is frustrating everybody. because there are people out there that look at the name and think it's only hunters and anglers. Oh. Uh, well, you but, go hunters, anglers, mountain bikers, hikers. Well, it's, yeah, it's just too long of a title. And and <laughs> and that that might be my only criticism of it is that when they came up with the name, it made very much sense that. Hunters and anglers are pretty much your backcountry folks because mm-hmm. it's yeah, 14 years old. For the most part. Uh, but in the last 10 years, the number of people that are just wanting adventure, the number of people that want to get outdoors, the number of people that want to go further and push that limit farther, and the there seems to be more media in it. You know, uh, the mountain climbing, the, the endurance race guys. You know these these hundred mile runners that do these long yeah, tracks through the mountains. The Bigfoot three sixty, whatever yeah, the fuck it, it is. Just crazy ass people. You know, uh, but They're it's mentally it's, ill is what it is. Well, I, I don't disagree. <laughs> 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 I want to go run three hundred miles. Yeah, come again. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and I want to do it without any sleep, uh, at the detriment of everything. <laughs> Why? Well, uh, well, out of their I, mind. I don't. People. I don't. Like, okay, but those track, those but folks are Jesus. there, uh, and when those folks are there and we're there and we're all together, you can't you can't put them all into one name. But we're all using the same land, correct? And the land is what's important. And backcountry hunters and anglers, to some, might be like, well, it's another hunting organization. Sure, which it might be. It's a lot of hunters, but if we can open those doors and we can bring in. I don't even care the bird watchers, you know, because oh, they're, they're they're one of the biggest ones that I have issue with, because they'd be the first people to shut down a crane season. Oh yeah, yeah, for no reason. By the way, delicious, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, ribeye the sky. I don't think I can give them that. That seems like a bit of a stretch. Yeah, it's a solid sirloin though. It's it's a tasty tasty piece. It's of meat. great. Yeah. It's better than goose, <clears throat> and I like go- and that's from someone who likes goose. Yeah, uh, I took the leg and thigh portions, uh, did sort of a Korean style braise on them, and then put it into uh, what are they? Uh, the little steam buns uh, with oh uh, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, for fuck's sake! But shredded the meat up and and put it in a steam bun with. Pickled carrots and cucumbers and a little sriracha and hoisin and just the best damn thing ever. <laughs> oh, I just thought of a dish I could make for the contest, but I need a good story to go with it. Damn it, how am I going to get a good story to go around that? 
So well, I'll keep that in the back of my mind. <laughs> I, I, I make these. A buddy of mine calls me, and he's like, hey, James, uh, it's my birthday. Uh, and for my birthday, Jess has rented me a nice house uh, over on Prior Lake. Uh, would you be interested in coming out? And we'll, we'll ice fish all day, drink some beers. It'll be a good time. I'm like, absolutely. So I put together these Sandhill Crane uh, steam buns uh, to bring mm. out while we're ice fishing. So we're sitting in this ice fishing shack. Give me chills thinking yeah. about it. Literally, I just got chills. We're sitting in this ice shack. We're having a good old time. We're drinking some beers. Not catching a thing. Because it's probably like. It's Yeah. So we're sitting there and knock on the door. And it's the sheriff. And he's just out there checking houses. Oh, okay. You know. Uh, so I look at the guy, and he's a young fella, and I'm just like, hey, come on in. Come on in. He's like, er, what? Like, <laughs> no, come on in, man. Uh, and we're talking, and he checks licenses mm-hmm. and makes sure everything's kosher. And I'm like, hey, here, try one of these. And he's like, what? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, we're just hanging out ice fishing, drinking some beers. Uh, try one of these. He's like, I noticed there wasn't a car outside. Uh, but there was stuff. I'm like, yeah. His wife dropped us off. Everything's good. We're just we're 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 gonna. <laughs> we're not get, making meth. I swear. Yeah, we're just gonna get drunk and have a good time. <laughs> and I was totally honest with the guy. I was like, I don't have to worry about driving home. Right. You yeah. know, you don't have to worry about us. So the guy sits down for a minute. And he tries one of these steam buns, and a bite into the steam bun. He's like. What is this? And, I, and then I tell him, and he's like, "Is that even legal?" And I'm like, "Of course it's legal." Uh, and you don't know where I took it. I could have went to yeah. Oklahoma. You don't no, know. Uh, Northwest Minnesota. Right? No, I know we, yeah. we do have a season here, but yep. most people think it's closed. But yeah. that doesn't mean you like a, well. And it a is lot of open in other states. It's yeah. open in the Dakotas. A lot of people so. think it's an endangered species yeah, and it's illegal, but no, nonsense. No. So he eats one of these things, and then he looks at us. And he's like, "All right, so uh, eight thirty tonight." <laughs> uh, this whole area is going to light up. Uh, if you go with white jig heads and a small crappie minnow, you'll do much better. So at 8.30 that night, nice. we're white jig heads and crappie minnow and the whole thing, and 15 crappies boom, out of that boom, hole boom, in boom, a boom. Nice. Yeah. Uh, but it just – food diplomacy, man. Food diplomacy. <laughs> I love it. That's great. <laughs> Feed it to them, and they'll tell you everything you want them to know. Way to a man's heart is through his stomach, or so I'm told. Yeah, I'm well. pretty sure it's a little lower, but anyways. Yeah, well. <laughs> subject. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Sure. Uh, and then I once saw a comedian say, I always found that with a knife directly through the chest <laughs> is easier. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good line. It's a good line. Do you remember the comedian? No, it was no. some lady. Uh, I forget. That's funny. I love stand-up. We used to be huge stand-up groupies. Uh, yeah. We haven't been to a stand-up show in a long time. I'll have to, to buy some tickets. It's been, yeah. it's been way too long. Uh, Saturday night. What's Cole. Saturday night? Joe Rogan at the XL Oh, that's right. Center. Rogan is in town. Yep. You know, I got to admit, and not that Rogan's ever going to listen to this podunk uh podcast but i love rogan i love his show i was mm-hmm. like i started listening to his the joe rogan experience probably yeah. within the first 50 episodes so i mean i'm not right out of the gate but pretty close right out of the gate because i watched his uh, joe rogan questions everything yeah and then his podcast started sh- shortly after that it actually might have been in the 20s of his episodes like i started pretty early and so it's weird to see this thing grow into the monster that it is now. Mm-hmm. But I love it. I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan. I've watched some of his specials. He's funny. But there's a lot funnier. Well, yeah. I, 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 I mean, You know what I mean? I mean I, I don't and know. I don't mean um, that as a knock to him. But because I'm a Joe Rogan fan for his podcast, doesn't yeah. make me want to run out and buy Joe Rogan tickets for his stand-up. What was – because Strange Times was the last one. Right. Which actually was pretty good. I yeah. laughed pretty good at that one. But the one right before that, what was that one called? I think that was, I don't remember what it was called, but I think that was the one where I was like, eh. And maybe I wasn't in the right mood. That's the thing about comedy. If you're not in the right mindset, yeah. it just doesn't hit you. Did he start off Strange Times with the how good is the weed in California now? I think so. Okay, because that bit just about shot me. Yeah. I was like, yeah. oh, my God. Yeah, no, that, like, actually, Strange Times was pretty good. Yeah. I, I did laugh pretty good. Because he that. said, <laughs> what did he say? He said, uh, I went in to buy some gummies, and I asked the kid, how are the gummies? And he went, ooh. It's <laughs> 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 like, ooh is not a unit of measure. <laughs> 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 No, I did. I did enjoy his last one. I yeah. have to admit, I did enjoy his last one. Um, I was. Oh, have you watched the new Chappelle? 
No. People are losing their minds over I've it. heard. It's great. I've heard. It's hilarious. He goes hard in the paint on the PC stuff. Yeah. Hard. And I love him for it. Yeah. No, Dave Chappelle is a genius. Uh, and for a long time, he's been a genius. It's hilarious. Uh, There's a few times that I, if had I been drinking something, I would have spit it out for oh sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, Do oh, you he remember? Went there. Oh, God. He Do went there. Do you remember that hilarious. skit? I think it was on the Chappelle show. That's Chappelle the show. skit he did where he was the blind white racist. Oh, yeah. that Everybody I knows him for that. <laughs> that's, like the, that's like his marquee bit. And oh. it's. <laughs> One of the funniest things I've ever witnessed in all of yes, my it days. Is. And yes, I love it how he is. introduced it. He's like, you know, I did this skit and I showed it to my family members and they looked at me like I set the black race back 80 <laughs> years. Fuck it, roll it. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. No, he shit. is funny. Uh, uh, and uh, who we, else? Oh, I saw him. We, we, um, he was on the street. I was down in uh, Austin, Texas mm -hmm. for uh, some training for my job. And apparently he had a show there that was didn't know. But we were just going, we were just bar hopping, walking along the street. And there's fucking Dave Chappelle walking yeah. down the street with two dudes, you know, buddies on either side of him. And of course, everybody's <coughs> saying, Dave, this, oh, we love you, Dave. And then someone's like, you know, what did the five fingers say to the face? You know? Can I get a short? The close, yes. I'm good. Thanks. And, um, and people are, you know, like, what did the five finger? They're starting to say his lines and stuff. And you just hear me goes, man, this is how it starts. <laughs> and my guys that I was with are like, oh, we should go talk to him. Like, let's just leave him alone, dude. Yep. He wants to be left alone. And I've always kind of been that way. I haven't, I don't have a ton of like celebrity run ins, but almost every time I'm like, just leave him alone, dude. They get bombarded yeah. all day, every day. Do you really need the. Well, His signature. Do you? That's, yeah. that's the thing Leave I've always on. felt. Like, you know, I've been places and I've seen a lot of these folks, and you look at them and you're like, okay, I could go over there, and I could be that idiot. Uh, and and then what am I going to do? Are he and I going to go out for drinks together? Right. It's going to yeah. be the best time of our lives? No. 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 The one time I did kind of do that, it <clears throat> backfired in my face. So I, I was uh, – traveling i was in atlanta airport i think i was going to see my brother in charleston so we had a, a layover or a, you know whatever change flights in atlanta i was big into professional wrestling at this time i get i'm hurrying to my my next flight and i see this giant dude and it just sticks out i didn't think anything of it at the time i look and i'm like and it's the giant not andre giant but mm -hmm. the new giant paul white yeah. the new giant and i was like holy crap when i see him then i see oh there's fit finley and there's um, who else is there? Uh, Jericho and uh, Eddie Guerrero, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I had one back. This disposable camera era where you had to <laughs> yeah, actually drop film off to get developed. Um, so I'm like, oh, no. I take that back. It was an actual camera with film in it. And I go, hey, I hate to bo bother you guys. You know, I just want to get a quick. And they're like, they were super cool. Like, yeah, no problem, you know. And basically taking a selfie with the, you know, before selfies were cool uh, with these wrestlers. And I had no film in the camera. Mm -hmm. And then it dawned on me. It's like I had, like, five pictures left on that roll. And I'm like, I'm just going to burn these up quick. And then when I get to Charleston, I'll throw a new film roll in, and then we'll be good to go. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I could have dug through my bag and put it. But I'm like, you know what? They're like, you can. It's fine. I'm like, no, I'm not. You guys got place to be. I got place to be. I appreciate your time. I didn't get an autograph or nothing. I've never been an autograph guy. What the hell do I want with your sign name? Yeah. What the hell is that going to do? Yeah. Uh, but it was just cool. They were all really, you know, I shook their hands and whatever. And, yeah. and away I went. Uh, it, that would have been a cool picture. I kind of yeah. wish I would have had it, but it's, I fucked it but up. But at the same time, it's probably a good thing we didn't have cameras back then. Ooh, uh, otherwise, yeah. there'd be a thousand or pictures everybody. of my dick <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a good thing in general <laughs> yep. that there's no evidence of things I've done in my youth. Exactly. When everybody, now everybody literally yep. has a camera, and they're yep. obsessed with filming everything. In, uh, in 97, uh, I was in uh, uh, Haneda, Japan, and I was flying home because my dad was getting married, and I'm sitting at the Haneda airport, <coughs> and I sit down next to this guy, and he's got a... Uh, case uh looks like a trumpet or something 
And I just kind of looked at him like, uh, you're, you're a musician? He goes, yeah, we were just here playing a concert. And I'm like, oh, very nice. Where were you playing? And he was talking about it a little bit. Got into it with him a little. And I was like, uh, well, who do you play with? And he's like, oh, B.B. King. And I was like, really? That's awesome. B.B. King's one of my favorites. And he's like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah. And he goes, hey, B.B., this guy likes you oh, a lot. Jesus and Christ. B.B. King is sitting on the <laughs> other side of him. <laughs> So hilarious. So yeah, I got I got to meet BB King there for a minute, and uh, oh god, that's so funny. And then I got to walk by him when he was in first class, and I had to go to the back of the plane. <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> hey, BB. Yeah. No, it was awesome. <laughs> yep. Ah, uh, that is so cool. One of the guys I want I've been talking to to get on this podcast. He's down. I just got to get down there, uh, set aside some time. Um, his uh, Instagram is Marsh Whisper, and he has like the only outfitter shop like on the you know strip in new orleans oh okay one of the guitarists the members of zz top married him and his wife as apparently he's an ordained minister nice yeah I'm like that is so cool yep. dude uh yeah he knows a ton of like famous people that come through there and, and they charter should, should you ever need an ordained minister i am are you uh, really yeah. an ordained? i have a buddy that asked me if i would do his <laughs> yeah. upcoming wedding if he if and when he actually does get married i'm like you know who you're talking to, right? I mean, my dad no. was a preacher, but I'm about the farthest thing from it. As am I. But I would do it. Uh, I would totally do it. Oh, yeah. No, and it's very simple. You go online and you click the box and you pay. So you've married uh, some people? Yep. Yep. My buddy Sean, uh, when he and his wife got married. Do you got to name your church? No. No? no. You don't have to do that? Because I want to come up with a cool-ass name. Well, I got to I gotta think of something. Nothing's stopping you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll uh, wait till I need to. I don't need yeah. to be a minister until I need to be a minister. Let so. me just see here. Uh, uh, I am so passing around the tithing I plates think, I think, during that wedding. I think, think I'm not. Uh, <laughs> MSC. MSC. Yeah. Ministry of Squirrel Cats. <laughs> <laughs> Squirrel, I like SCM better. Yeah. Squirrel Cat Ministry. Squirrel Cat so Ministry rolls a little better. Yeah, I like it too. I think there's room for improvement. The <laughs> what we need to pray before this meal. Yeah. Oh, great Squirrel Cat! <laughs> All the mighty Squirrel. Oh, great mighty Squirrel Cat! <laughs> we come before you today, dear sweet baby <laughs> Jesus Squirrel Cat. <laughs> Squirrel cat. Oh my god, I can't wait to mess with that. Oh, I'm gonna it's, have fun with Photoshop. I, I really I think squirrel cat is <sighs> the best uh, oh, hashtag. And I just I need to get a line. Well I'm I'm I will definitely hashtag this episode with uh, hashtag squirrel cat. Hashtag it's gonna, squirrel it's gonna cat. say one post. Yeah. Actually no, I think it says less than a hundred. It's definitely gonna be less than a hundred. <laughs> You're gonna look it up right I, now. I think we have to look if it up just a, to see if there's a hashtag squirrel cat. Shit bricks <laughs> um, if there's a hashtag squirrel cat. Let's just see this here. Is be Search, and then we gotta go oh up my here. God. That is hilarious. And hashtag. Where are we at? I don't even know how long we've been recording. Scroll. Seven o'clock. I got here about four. Cat. Fewer than a hundred posts. But there is one. Yep. Hashtag squirrel cat. Hashtag squirrel. There's a couple of them. <laughs> like what makes those squirrel cats so? Um. <laughs> <laughs> That is a squirrel cat. <laughs> That's a squirrel cat right there. <laughs> <laughs> ah, fuck, they beat us to it. Uh, oh, so there's a cat in a tree. Cat in a tree. Yeah, cat. I don't know that that qualifies. Oh, but my God. Yep. <coughs> That's hilarious. Hashtag squirrel cat. Yeah, we're going with it. Hashtag squirrel cat. We need shirts or something. That is too funny. What does BHA have coming up in the state of Minnesota? September 26th, we have uh, the Filson Storytellers Night. Uh, What's so, that? That sounds awesome. Yeah, September 26th, Thursday night over in Hopkins, Minnesota. Uh, there's a uh, – Filson has been putting these things on, and Filson has signed on as a, a sponsor of BHA. So around the country, they've been doing these storyteller nights where they get some folks to come up and they tell – great hunting stories or great outdoor stories uh two years ago in boise they kind of launched it uh everybody came up ranella told his meat tree story uh oh, dude that's an amazing yeah. story dude. uh as amazing as that story is and it was the grand finale and it was the end uh remy warren's story about how he got his wife to marry him 
Uh, I don't think I've heard that one. It's uh, a billion times better. A billion. That's a pretty big number. Yeah. Uh, huh? Wow. Uh, All right. Remy Warren, apparently. Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, Remy Warren dated this woman for a while. Apparently things didn't work out. She had a job offer somewhere else. He was doing other things. They went separate ways. Uh, no animosity, no hard feelings. And a couple of years later, apparently, his sis- her sister called and said, hey, uh, she's missing. Her car was found at a trailhead, and nobody's seen her in a couple of days. And Remy said, I'll find her. And he walked off into a million and a half acres of wilderness and had to go through the governor of Nevada because the National Guard wasn't going to let him go find her. What? Wandered around in the wow. wilderness for two days, found her. Uh, delirious. Why wouldn't they let it? Why wouldn't? Why? Because he was just a civilian. Well, what does it uh, matter? He yeah. could be hiking in the woods all he wants. Yeah, but they didn't want another person out there uh, with the potential of getting lost. Wow. Uh, wanders off into the wilderness, tracks her, finds her. Uh, she's delirious when he finds her. He radios for help. They're going to send So that's when out. he asked her to marry him when she's delirious. Oh, no, no, no. No. <laughs> no. Uh, but he says, uh, he says, I didn't know what to do when I found her. She didn't know who I was. Uh, so I just held her, uh, and I sang her songs uh, that I thought she'd remember. And eventually she warmed up a little bit and kind of came to, and the only thing she had to say with him, to him was, I knew you'd find me. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, then he followed that line with, uh, so I had to save her life, but she married me. <laughs> <laughs> She kind of has to at that point. Yeah, at that point you're committed. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're kind of indentured at that point. <laughs> I mean, there's not many things that a man can hold over a woman to win arguments for a lifetime, but that's a big one. That's it. That's yep. a big one. That, that prob- so, that's probably the one. They've been doing these throughout the country, and uh, we've got a few storytellers. Uh, uh, so where is, where is it at again? Hopkins. There's a theater in Hopkins, Minnesota, that we're going to be doing it at. Okay. Uh Ashley Peters is signed up to be a storyteller. I don't know all are of them just yet. Tickets? Are yep. There? How do you? Yep. Go to BHA. There? Uh, we have a Facebook page. Okay. Uh, MNBHA, or if you go to backcountryhunters.org, uh, it's on the national website as well, and you can get tickets. Um, Traeger is apparently sponsoring it as well, uh, and they will be out there serving sliders. Whoops! Not M. <coughs> Minnesota Backcountry Hunters and Anglers on Facebook, MN underscore BHA on Instagram. What is it on Facebook? Uh, Minnesota Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. So it's MN or is it? Minnesota. It's spelled, spelled out. It's spelled out Minnesota. Minnesota Back. It's all one word. No, it's probably two words. No, Backcountry is one word. And then back Hunters and Anglers. Country. It should come up. There it is. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Boom. Got it. Is that one? Right. Should be a picture. Why isn't there no picture? Is that not the oh, right one? Oh, give it time. That might not be it. Uh, I don't think that's the one. Nope, this is the one. That's the one, yep. And then as you thumb through that, you'll see there's a advertisement on there that we're okay. putting it out. Oh, Campfire Stories. I see it. Is that the one? Campfire BHA. Yep, September yeah. 26th, presented by. I'm just going to mark interested, and then I'll get the notifications for it. Yep. That would be really interesting. That'd so be it's it's going to be a fun night. They're going to have a number of storytellers. We tried to get a couple of bigger names to come, but September 26th is a really hard time to get somebody from the hunting community. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> they might actually be doing <laughs> yeah, what they're something. known for. Uh, so it'll be fun. Stories are always fun. Uh, there will be some giveaways. Uh, I think we've got a couple of packs and some other giveaway stuff to do that night. So. How's the membership here in Minnesota? Um, so we've pretty much been doing really well uh doubling almost every year that's Uh, very well yep so we're up to 1400 i believe right now uh for the state of minnesota but part of the problem is uh nobody knows who we are there you go Uh, so we're trying to get that word out that uh we're a conservation organization we're focused on public lands uh because i think in my opinion, at least, and I know I'm completely biased, <laughs> uh, but in my opinion, it's a type of organization that everybody should have at least heard of. 
uh, whether you want to support it or not, it's up to you. But it's important enough that everybody should at least know who it is and make an opinion based on that. Well, when I get home, I will definitely join yeah. again or re-up or whatever. Yeah. I'm almost positive that I've joined in the past. Um, so however that works, so definitely get in. Because it is something that I am. I stand yeah. behind. I remember when you Mediator know, did that thing with the public landowner. I love the public landowner. It's perfect, kind of isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's That great. shirt that they have is just so poignant, and everybody sees it and signs on. Because it's really what it is. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's really important that people – Realize that like, if you yeah. pay taxes, this is your land. Dude. Yeah, this go enjoy it. And, and you if you don't want to hunt, if you don't want to fish, it doesn't matter. That's fine. If all you want to do is go sit underneath a tree and read a book, that's what it's there for. Just go enjoy it. And the Unless more and more we're watcher. doing that, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just I have issues with bird watchers because I get they're it. so anti hunting, and it's like you don't understand. This, yeah, this, no, the, I I have a the friend. land that we set aside for hunting gives you more songbirds. Yes, I, I, I have a friend who works for the Autobahn Society, uh, and in talking, uh, there was an issue with the Minnesota Vikings Stadium because the glass is yep. a problem. Um, and right before I had talked, uh, there was a statistic put out there that cats. That was my uh, argument. Yeah, kill somewhere around 2 billion songbirds a year. And I'm like, so where does the Autobahn Society stand on cats? Exactly. Uh, and and the response was, uh, the only thing the Autobahn Society loves more than their birds is their yeah, cats. cats <laughs> that kill their birds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I said I made yeah. that's funny you say that cuz I made a, I made a very similar post on that when I saw that uh, that article about the Yeah. I'm like for one, it's anti-sports. Yeah. Because We've had shiny glass windows in downtown Minneapolis for a long time that kill plenty of birds. You know, the IDS Tower, yeah. Northwest Tower, all Target <coughs> Center, the new Target Center, all these kill plenty of birds every year. You didn't hear a peep, no yeah. pun intended. But they, the sports thing went up, and all of a sudden the dead birds are this huge thing. It's like if you're bitching about your dead birds, you better not be letting Fluffy out at night. Well, it was it was a way to get their name into a current topic. Yeah, and I, I think that's all it was. That it really ruffles my feathers. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you appreciate my dad jokes. My, uh, my kids do not. By the way, greatest dad joke ever told. Oh, I, my, here we my, go. my daughter just told me. I've told everybody I've met. <laughs> it is the greatest dad joke ever, and I, I everybody should know this joke. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> oh, God. That's just... That's hard to argue. Yeah, If you've exactly. never seen them, they must be awesome at it. Yeah, it's just, it's my favorite oh, joke. Oh, God, that's, that's almost up there. My wife, bless her heart, and her family, <coughs> there's two jokes that irritate the shit out of me that they just howl. The one is... What's brown and sticky? Uh A stick. Okay. They literally laugh at that. It drives me wild. I understand. The other one is, ask me if I'm an orange. Are you an orange? Nope. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Right? It's so dumb. And they think it's the funniest shit of all time. Oh, I just... No, it, it only works if there's participation, and God. it has to be the right participation. But what is a pirate's favorite letter? R. R. Wrong. R. It is the C they love. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm stealing that. That's awesome. Yeah, because everybody knows it's it. this direction, yeah. And, and everybody thinks they've got it, and they nail you on it, and then you just come Arts right back. It's the C they love. Oh, that's perfect. I am so using that forever and ever. Amen. Oh, just cutting out there. Fortunately, I think it's just my headphones, but that's an amazing joke. That's yeah. my favorite one. That that mm-hmm. beats the elephant's hide in the tree one by far. It's a perfect misdirection. Yeah. That one's great. Where'd you hear that one? I don't even I know. I, think I always daughter. think of who's the first person that came up with these things. Yeah. You know, certain funny things or funny lines or a meme that you see, I'm always like, who is the first one? Yeah. They're never getting credit for it. Like no, ever, ever, ever. No. Even like certain things, like 
um, just speech and pop pop culture like um, uh, what would be a good example I know right when did everybody start saying that yeah like who was the first person that went I know right now are we and uh, it just uh, caught keeping on. it clean here or oh you uh, say whatever you want okay fuck hard uh, <laughs> I I came up with <laughs> I don't know why that just made me laugh so much, but it did. It's I, a great word. I, I started using fucktard somewhere around two thousand three. Uh, it was my favorite word for a That's long a time. Great word. Yeah, uh, and then uh, Anthony Bourdain started using it uh, okay. later. Yeah, who's the first guy? Yeah, I think I was. You think uh, it was for you? I, think I, the I, 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 I think that was me. Uh, I had never seen it or heard it prior to that. Uh, I started using it, and then in like 2009, 2010, uh, Anthony Bourdain <laughs> wrote it in <laughs> Medium Raw, his book, uh, and I read the word fucktard <laughs> in his book, and I was like, hey, guy, that's mine. Guy totally stole that from me. <laughs> Should have sued him. Uh, that's. <laughs> That's a great word. I um, so I've always so. Here's an original that hasn't caught on. <laughs> is so you can basically put tard on the end of anything. Oh yeah, yeah. But we've always said fish tard. Mm-hmm. So those th- and you know who I'm talking. You know, no, I, know I know you know people that are fish tarded. The people that go out and they just they got the giant buoy bobber, the red and white thing, with a leader with a gold hook on the bottom. Mm-hmm. Monded up with night crawlers and they're fishing for sunfish, but because there's pike in this lake, they don't want to get cut off. Yeah. That dude, if you're that dude listening to this right now, you're a fish dart. That hasn't caught on. No, nope. take fish dart. <laughs> no, uh, it's a good one. But it, but ta- the tart, uh, but the tart part, not when, PC when, anymore. No, it's not. So we've gone to a separate one uh, that I know I can credit to Rick Edwards uh, when referring to somebody. That doesn't see things the way you do. Uh, they are a douche waffle. A douche waffle. Yes. I've heard of twa waffle. <coughs> yeah. Or douche canoe. No. So you've kind of combined those two in, in a unique yes. one. Yes. A douche waffle. That's a good one. Yeah. It's, it's, it really encapsulates yeah. uh, where cu- you're going with it. A couple of new hashtags for the <laughs> evening. <laughs> Right. I right. might leave some of those hashtags off. Yeah, right uh, after Squirrel Cat. You know what? I probably won't. I'll probably no. put them in there. Why Throw the them not? in there. Why not? Yeah. What's it going to hurt? Maybe bring some more listeners to the Full yeah. Scale Outdoors podcast. Well, we'll be, we'll be controversial <laughs> at the very least. <laughs> hey, negative clicks. It's proven they have algorithms on Facebook. The negative yeah. clicks get the most clicks. Absolutely. And if somebody so, wants to hate fuck your podcast, <laughs> <laughs> then by all means. At least somebody's getting some action for this <laughs> podcast or me, whatever. Um, so I, I'm not, I'll leave names out to protect the innocent, but the podcast previous to this one, mm-hmm. as I recorded it, I didn't know anything about the individual. Right. Uh, as the social media shitstorm <laughs> kept spinning, some things came out about said individual that are not very flattering. Right. Um, but a couple things with that, I like to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Social media is a terrible place. Yes. Um, with that said, there are some things that kind of speak for themselves. I mean, there are actual nope. legal records in that. But again, but I give everybody again, the benefit of the doubt. It's, it's not like it's not like people can't change and things aren't better in the future. You so hope, we, that, and we that's kind of what I told somebody earlier today. I said, you know what? Shouldn't I always really judge people on what they used to do? Honestly, hope. <clears throat> that these these things happened. They they obviously happened. They're facts. They're recorded. I hope that he's learned from them. Yeah. And that that he that he moves on and that good things happen for him. What happened? He took a great animal. That yeah. and that's what the podcast was about. Was and that's all it was about because I didn't know any of this shit beforehand. Yep. And uh, well, and truthfully, I mean, I had no hey, idea they were selfishly. That big here. They don't usually get that no. big here. That's why when I first saw the picture, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. This is a story. Yeah. And it is a story. Now it has a backstory, but it's like, you know. Everything does. As long as everything about this particular bear checks out, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. The selfish plus side, the people that don't like the guy. They might listen to the podcast just because of that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna, the, looking the, the for more ammunition. Clicks, I'm gonna get. Uh, I might get some more downloads because of it. So you yeah. know, you know, there's 
there's some silver lining to a potential dark cloud. Exactly. Um, but I do, yeah. I honestly do just, I try to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. As people are just so quick to this cancel culture that we have and yeah. just calling people out. And I don't know. It might all be true. I don't know. Maybe maybe everything they say is true, but I've only talked can't to the dude be for true. a couple, Yeah. you know, for an hour, a little over an hour. So I don't. I'm not going to sit here and and give you a judgment of him one way or the other. All I know is from what little I, that I've engaged with him, he seemed like a cool dude. Yeah. I mean, I didn't get a bad vibe from him. So, like I said, hopefully he's learned from his mistakes and he's growing and moving on as we all should grow and move on. Yeah. It's like coming back again full circle to BHA. It's like we have to learn to get along. Yes. We our voice is much bigger together. We, we can't just, you know, dig our heels into the ground. Yep. And I'm a this and I'm a that. I hate those four-wheelers. They tear up my trails. Well, then let's set aside some spots where they can use. But that means yeah. if we maybe go you into don't get it, the bow hunting there. If we go into it knowing that they can use them, perhaps if you're going there, then you know that not you're not going to be angry. Right. The same thing with uh, mountain bike trails. Yes. Give them trails. And then, you know what? Don't put a stand-up next to a mountain bike trail. Yeah. If you know it's a designated mountain bike trail, probably not the best place for right. a tree stand. Or wait until late November when you know those sallies will be inside. <laughs> it's probably uh-huh. true. There might be a couple hardcore ones. but There are. You know. I'm one of them. <laughs> are you a mountain biker? Yeah. You evil mountain biker. I know. God, gross. I don't know. I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the few times I've done it, it is actually pretty fun. Yeah. But I need another hobby, like a fucking hole in the head. So you and me both. I, I, there's only so many things I can do. And when yeah. it comes down to, like, the foraging, yep. I love doing that. It's hard to find time for all of these yep. things. And I am, like, a serial DIY person. So the more food preservation I can do, the, like, I haven't gotten to canning, but, like, I'm fighting the urge to get oh, into canning. No, it's like, I it. don't need another it's, thing. It's, it's so incredibly and insanely simple. <sighs> you know, this here. Thing. Can't you just can my stuff for me? Can sure. I just drop off stuff and you do it for me? Sure, if you want to go to my <laughs> job for me. <laughs> That's my point. Like, yep. where am I going to find time to do all this yep. stuff? I still, I go to Goose Hunt in the morning. I did this the other weekend. We Goose Hunt in the morning. We get done. Oh, shit. That was a good day. We were done by 1030. Might as well go home, change clothes, and hook up the boat. Fuck it. Why not? Yeah. Fish till dark. It's like, I mean, when do I have time to do this? The garden. My garden is completely neglected. I feel terrible about but it. It's, it's, it. So canning is very interesting because when I started canning, there were certain things that I wanted to do uh, and I wanted to perfect. So jams and jellies. Uh, I make like three varieties. And that's it. I do a high bush cranberry jelly. I do a, a wild grape and cardamom jelly, and then I do a strawberry rhubarb and vanilla. Uh, mm. And they're they're all good, and they all have different purposes. Okay, your uh, high bush cranberry is pungent. Uh, it's not very good on its own. You can eat it by itself, but it's not necessarily the greatest thing on earth. However. A little chicken stock, a little high bush cranberry jelly, uh, reduce it down. It makes a nice little pan sauce to put on top of your grouse. You know what's so weird? When you say those things, like in my mind, as you say all those ingredients, like my mind starts putting yeah. in those flavor profiles. Like I can actually, in my mind, taste what you're putting together. Yeah. So uh, uh, butter, shallots, uh, garlic, saute them down till they're soft, uh, add a couple tablespoons of the high bush cranberry jelly, a little chicken stock, reduce it all the way down, makes a nice sauce, pan sear grouse breast, pour your sauce over. Simple, mm. easy, uh, and delicious. Oh so good. Uh, uh, wild grapes and cardamom. Uh, adding spice to your jellies is a wonderful thing. Adds a different little complexity to it. Uh, you take that, a little brie cheese and maybe some crackers, and you're good to go. Mm. Uh, strawberry, rhubarb, and vanilla jam. Put it on everything. Yeah, literally, you can put that yeah. on everything. And, and it's phenomenal. It's 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 my favorite thing. Uh, but jams and jellies were easy. So then you move on to other canned goods. 
uh, zucchini relish, uh, pickles, uh, little things like that. Green beans. We get green beans left and right. I love canned green beans. I love pickled green beans. Uh, I usually just freeze my green beans. Yeah, but then you end up with that weird, like, the outer surface of it kind of sh- chafes off. And, yeah, uh, sometimes it yeah. Can, yeah. I don't like that. Uh, but I do everything. Beets, you know, pickled beets. Hated That's them when the thing I was I a just kid. Re- I just discovered that I like. Yeah. Well, you so hated them as a kid. Well, I'm not a huge, like, pickle fan. Like, I don't like dill yeah. pickle. Like, it's the dill. This is the flavor yeah. I'm not really crazy about. But in general, pickled things I'm not a huge fan of for whatever reason. Um, but I've always liked sweet pickles. Yeah. Pickled beets taste exactly like sweet pickles. Yes. I was, like, blown away. Yeah. Because well, in my in my, you know grown-up life and everybody knows me is like that's bullshit but whatever it's like i'm trying i'm I'm going back to things that i thought i didn't like and i'm trying them yeah just like your taste buds change yes. as you get older like try stuff you never know what you might like yep. you know you're just limiting yourself if you're not somewhat culinarily and adventurous yeah so you know we're at one of these old supper clubs that have the buffet and there's the pickled beets there yeah uh i'm like well i'm gonna just try one of these i haven't had one of these in probably 25 years i took a bite and i was like these are sweet pickles. Yeah, they're delicious. I love these. Yeah. So I would totally get into that. And roasted beets, too. Maybe uh, I haven't you know, really messed with that, oh but yeah, that sounds ro- good. Roasting beets is wonderful. Roast them. takes a while. It's a preparation thing. It's like an hour in the oven. Uh, but once they're good and roasted and you peel them and you cube them up into small little bite-sized pieces, uh, take uh, golden beets, red beets, uh, and then maybe throw in a little bit of something green in there. Uh, mix in some crumbled blue cheese and then top it all off with a little balsamic mm. vinaigrette. And you've got cheese. this little beet salad. That sounds, that's just, that sounds amazing. Yeah, it's sweet and it's delicious. And oh, the so blue good. cheese is in there. Have you messed with uh, like duck confit, like oh, wild duck confit? God, yes. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. That that could be the thing yeah, goose that tips confit. the canning so, so, into my favor. Well, and that's not canning. Uh, so the thing with duck confit uh, is most wild duck legs are small. And right. there's, there's very little on them. However, most of your geese are much bigger. Uh, you can confit anything. Okay. Pheasant, that just grouse. means in fat, right? The well, confit it's, in a, it's loosely a, translated it's from a, the French. Yeah, it's a cure is. in a fat. So uh, traditional duck confit or goose confit, uh, you make a salt and sugar dry brine. Uh, and you can season that with whatever you want. Uh, rub it on your goose breasts or goose legs. Uh, and thighs, and then let them sit for anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. After that, you rinse them off real good, pat them dry, and then submerge them in duck fat or goose fat. And then at a very low temperature, 200, 210 degrees, uh, cook them. Doing that in an oven where you can control the temperature? Okay. Put them in the oven. Otherwise, if you want to get, if you've got like a pellet grill, uh, and you can control your temperatures real well, Throw them in there and get a little smoke right, element into that. Stove. You don't want to do this in a pot in a stove top. You want to control. No, it, the it's got to be a low heat. Okay. If you do it on top, you're gonna cook them too fast. They end up weird and textured. Uh, but in goose fat at 200 degrees, six to eight hours, uh, let them just sit. And then when they're done, you just let them sit until it's room temperature again. And the the salt sort of extracts the liquid from the meat. And then when you cook it in fat, it pulls the fat in where the liquid mm. was. So now the meat is full of all this just deliciousness. Uh, and when you let them sit, that fat then solidifies again. And then you pull them out. And you can pack them in a jar with a little bit of fat. And they'll stay forever. Uh, I usually just uh, take the legs and put them into so vacuum seal bags. So you put them in a jar... So you just put them in a vacuum sealed bag. I just put them in vacuum okay. sealed bags because jars are expensive. And but if you were doing it in a jar, you don't have to like seal it, you don't, boil it, no, anything like that. You just the, put some fat on top. Because the idea and it's is good. when the fat solidifies, it seals everything in, and then you put that in the refrigerator or the freezer. I like to do it in the vacuum sealed bag because then I can stack them in the freezer a little better, and you need less fat because uh, you don't have to fill up all the space. You can just put a little fat okay. in there. Uh, so it's it's perfect in that method. And then when it comes out, you scrape a little fat off, you put it in the frying pan, you heat them back up in the fry pan, or you put them in the oh, oven, and you roast them. I can't wait to do that this fall. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful because it shreds off the bones so beautifully. Everything comes off. You've also slow-cooked it now, so all those tendons and ligaments and everything are all soft. Down. 
You can eat all of it. The fat, the skin, everything so is good. Before you bag it, you taking the bones out. No, before leave the you bones bag in. It, you just leave everything yeah, right leave in the there. bones okay. all in. Just make sure they're not sharp when you bag it because sure. you'll pull yeah, through. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, but then once you're done with it, you take that out, and after that, there's a thing called riet. Uh, you take all the meat, you put it in your KitchenAid mixer with the paddle on it, and you get it going. You leave all your meat in there. You put a little fat in there. You let it keep going, and it breaks all those tissues apart and mixes the fat in until it's almost like a whipped pate. Okay. Uh, but all it is is meat and fat. Uh, and then you can take that and spread it on bread. You can do a dozen different things with that. Yeah, I'd like to leave the meat whole though, in like a like a sandwich or something. Oh, you can. Yeah, absolutely. Take the take the chunk the meat off. Uh, grill apples, and then take a little grilled apple and some brie and that confit and put <laughs> it on a baguette. Yeah, uh, and eat the hell out of it. I need to hang out with you more often. Sure. Although I do have an option. I do. I do have a. a a proposal for you. Yes. This is a, you're going to say yes, but I do have a, a buddy of mine. Him and his brother are big beaver hunters, and I'm, I'm going to get them on the podcast. But what we should do is plan. You said you wanted to dabble into the beaver yes. trapping thing. We should just all be in contact with them. We'll set yes. up a weekend this winter because they do the under ice yep. trapping, and uh, we'll just set it up. We'll make and then a weekend beaver because he hasn't eaten beaver yet and i've okay. been on him about it and he's a little tentative to dive into it so beaver so cone fee is be, a thing i bet it is and and you still use the duck and goose fat uh but oh you're not using beaver fat no you're using duck and you goose use fat. duck or goose uh, and you do that or you could use pork fat uh no, which no, is no, a little no, bit no, more red duck and goose yeah uh but then it's all there uh, the other thing I'd really like to do, and it's the child in me, I want to make a beaver sausage. <laughs> <laughs> so do you put the sausage in the beaver or the beaver in the sausage? Well, uh, <laughs> chicken or the egg, brother. <laughs> God. Oh. <laughs> uh. You just got to, like I said, you just have to let the jokes fly. Yeah. I mean, you can't fight them. They're going to happen, so you yep. just got to go with it. So, I mean, we could always have, like, a, a moose knuckle beaver pie meal or something. Yeah, I mean, and if I could get camel toe, I'd bring <laughs> them. <laughs> oh, God, it's hilarious. Jamie, give everybody your information uh, where they can find you. you got, I, well, you know what you didn't bring up? You write for the Outdoor News, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, there you go. They can, uh, this they can year I have. See your work uh, at the Outdoor News. Outdoor News, uh, I, I've been a contributor this year. Uh, Modern Carnivore or modcarn.com is where you find most of my recipes. You have to cook it right.com is still up and running. Uh, I just haven't updated anything on there in a long time, but there's still 300 some recipes on there. Uh, Outdoor Life's Cast Iron Chef blog uh, has a bunch of recipes on it. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah, everything. Do me a favor, send me a like. Send me all that yeah. in a message as I can put it in the show notes Absolutely. Or so people can, can uh, find you and follow you. On Twitter and Instagram, at you cook it right. At you cook it right. And he does. His pictures put all my shit to shame. But that just means i got to elevate my game a little bit. Yeah. And uh, I might have to do that competition next year. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. When is that usually the same time every uh, year? Usually, I think we're going to stick with uh, August. Uh, we did it in September, and nobody showed up because everybody's on. Yeah, that's yep. that's probably so. Summertime is usually good. It was a good turnout this year. A lot of fun. Uh, good bonfires. That lots of good would food. Be a lot. Tons of great uh, food. Yep. And I'm pretty competitive. So yeah, I don't mind getting my butt kicked if it's for a good reason. So Absolutely. That's awesome, Jamie. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Tim. And uh, we will stay in touch whether you like it or not. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, later. Yep.